The Dead Space remake offers us all new details into what really happened on board the Planet Cracker class ship, the USG Ishimura. In this video, I will be attempting to pull you through the ventilation of the story through the halls of the terror and into the more of the events that stack together to create an unforgettable story of self-preservation. Those who fought to help others survive the onslaught. Those who fought to understand. Those who fought to save loved ones. And those who ran away when the voices inside their heads came looking for them. Nearing to the 24th century, a war had broken out between the two governing bodies in human space, the Earth government and the sovereign colonies. The forces on Earth, however, would slowly begin to turn the tides, with public support favoring them, something that the sovereign colonies would call a rebellion, along with calling the public secessionists, who joined the Earth government's cause who called the opposing faction tyrants. The battles, however, would take more of the higher and more experienced ranks in the sovereign elite force, forcing the faction to rely on conscription. Desperate for a way out, the colonies would soon look towards records that would hold a great and terrible power if unlocked. The research on the black marker the scientist, Dr. Iando Dukaj, would note that Altman's expulsion from the project had been unfortunate, that it seemed the records had been incomplete. However, this did not stop them, with the Earth government nipping at their heels. The sovereign colonies began construction on three separate planets by contracting a corporation known as the CEC. There they would help construct the stations necessary to the research being held there. And soon the scientists had managed to reconstruct the blueprints thought to have been lost to them. This would allow the colonies to build three duplicates of the black marker, which had been dubbed as the red markers due to the visible difference in hue. Once the markers had been sent to the planets, the three monoliths of red would be activated all at the same time, and all research would be sent directly to General Ambrose Caden, who was busy fighting on the battlefields. The CEC, however, would deploy a PSEC unit on Aegis 7 for more security as per their contract. The markers upon activation would connect with the master signal, which would make the scientists think that these wide band frequencies had been originating from the monoliths. These frequencies would range from sound waves to alpha, delta, and theta brain waves. The signal would appear to be mostly harmless to the specialists working there at first. However, this was only to be the beginning, as soon the people stationed there would begin to see things in their sleep. Things that would disturb them to the point that it would force them out of their slumber and back into reality. Over and over again, until insomnia would begin to fall into place, and a depression would soon follow. Deaths had been sure to follow as well. The scientists would eventually find out what one of the properties of this genetic signal would do when the corpse would rise once again. However, they also found that this dead man, this necromorph, couldn't go near the marker, leading into another discovery of the dead space field. However, the discovery did have a downside. Two doctors had been killed in finding out about the necromorph transformation, which had been Dr. Hogan and Dr. Clifton. The two had been wheeled away to the clinic at the station, where Dr. Abaphany would begin documenting the potential of the marker signal's range, and to his luck, or later, regret. The bodies would begin to transform. The morphing and rearrangement of the body's anatomy would be so gruesome, so disturbing, the good doctor would not be able to keep his dinner inside of himself, and he would puke it all up over the laboratory. 
The transformation included the bulging of Dr. Clifton's esophagus, followed by the jaw collapsing in on itself. The head begins to pull away, splitting apart, reforming into what looked like a proboscis. The chest begins to split also, ripping in two, exposing the inner material and organs of the human anatomy to the doctor. He couldn't believe what he had been witnessing. The body continued to rearrange itself with the arms and legs conjoining together all the way to the toes and fingers meeting creating powerful claws until all that was left of the once Dr. Clifton had been a giant bat-like appearance that began spraying the yellowish briny liquid all over the glass window which made observation difficult, almost like it had been all a part of some strategy to get the doctor to unlock the door. However, all of this was for naught as the doctor remained in his chair. All of a sudden, a sound came up from the rig link as Dr. Abaphany had answered the sudden intrusion. He saw it had been p asking for someone to come down there to euthanize something or someone. The doctor would send his colleagues away to begin those procedures when he would hear something happening in the other containment unit. He could hear the crunching and squelching of the legs, crackling and rearranging themselves in Dr. Hogan's cell. They had been mixing together with a set of his internal organs, creating a tail with a sharp looking end to it, reminiscent of a scorpion formation. Soon the jaw began to reformulate with several fangs appearing from the mouth. Dr. Abaphany was in disbelief of what these could be used for, as the mouth could not accommodate the change, and just as he thought this, the necromorph had answered the question, with the head splitting open, showing the doctor that anything was to be possible now. The leaper began to circulate the room like a wild beast, shifting its weight from one palm to the other. He began to question if he or it could see him, when it suddenly looked upwards to the ceiling, and that's when he too could see what stopped the creature in its tracks. A vent had been present. As the necromorph began to pry the seals off, the doctor panicked and began to run for the door, when suddenly a crashing could be heard, and the necromorph had come for him, where it stops him by slicing through his internal materials, his flesh. Dr. Abaphany had been so eager to see if the signal could reach the corpses from very far away that he never thought that his observations would be turned against him. He screamed out for the PSEC, hoping that rescue may be on their way. However, no one had been there to answer the pleads for his own life. Soon the station had been thrown into chaos as more necromorphs began to hunt down the life that ultimately spawned them until only a few doctors had remained. The marker needed the makers to be present so that they could be consumed by the outbreak as well, so that all may become whole. However, they were not present here, so the marker would send a vision to one of the scientists, Dr. Foster, in order to ensure that at least one goal may be made whole, which would prove successful as the doctor took the mental blueprint and built the device known as the Bedestial, and the team managed to fight back the hordes long enough to combine the two devices together. The red marker had unleashed its full capability, forcing the dead to sleep and the living to see what could not be forgotten, the mental blueprint, so that another may be built. The amplified marker would lead into the discovery of what the scientists had dubbed as the master signal, which would lead them straight to Tau Volantis. However, over the years, the Sovereign Colony Council would compile all of the data on the markers and the necromorphs, to which they determined that they posed such a threat to humanity's existence among the stars that only one thing must be done, the entire eradication of their order, the sites, the computer records, and their own soldiers must perish, ironically, in order to preserve life in the galaxy, leaving Aegis 7, Asperia, and Crema held under a restriction that the Earth government would abide by, out of caution, 
However, as we all know, time is patient, and curiosity often leads into the demise of said caution. Welcome to the complete history of the Aegis system remade. In the resource-stricken times, several human factions would begin to fight amongst each other for the dwindling resources. These skirmishes would later lead into a war known as the Resource Wars, attempting to quell the chaos. The Concordian's Extraction Corporation would build the USG Ishimura in 2446, where they would call it the Planet Cracker. Over the years, the Ishimura had proven itself to be the saviour of the colonies, as its career grew over the years, providing humanity with a plethora of resources, which soon led to the end of these resource wars, and the several nations would stand down. Moving through the timeline, we come to Nicole Brennan, who had been working as a neuropsychiatrist in the American Republic. She would find herself being in the service of one Octavia Clark, a unitologist who had a past with depression and a personal anguish from the disconnect between her and Isaac's father, Paula Clark. Nicole would attempt to reason with Octavia about the Church of Unitology. However, she would find that to be an exceedingly arduous task. But once Paula had returned after his off-world tour as an award-winning ship architect had come to a close, Nicole would find that her previous task would come much easier. In between sessions, Isaac and Nicole had begun to date, even moving in together, and soon Nicole would be convinced that Octavia was of a sound mind to return home with her son and husband. At this time, however, the CEC would make their long-awaited return to the Cygnus system, known to them as the Aegis Cluster, with the Prospector ships breaching the restriction laws. At first, they would feel like their efforts had been in vain. However, as soon as they had scanned the seventh planet from the sun, they would be in disbelief of just how high the deposits had been for this planet. With the large number of minerals, ores, and materials, pulling the CEC back to Aegis 7, and soon the plans to colonize the planet had been drawn up and they would send Carfusia to oversee the development of the future colony, marking the demise of said caution. In the following year, Nicole would be commended for her patience and practice, along with her determination in helping her patient, so much so that she had been selected for a promotion in the medical field to be a senior medical officer. There had only been one downside. The position would require her to travel as the role would be aboard the most famous and flagship of the CEC, the USG Ishimura. Nicole was at first hesitant to join the crew of the Planet Cracker. However, after some grilling from Isaac, with him telling her of his time on board the USG Ishimura and all the repair jobs he had conducted over the years, she would soon accept the position and she would travel to the CEC headquarters with Isaac, which was in low orbit around the Earth. 
On board the Ishimura, however, there were those who knew of the decommissioning the following year, and one had seen fit to make preparations where they would send a message to one of their friends, who had a proposition for them which had been to work within the Titan mines. Moving back to the Aegis Cluster on the Aegis Seven colony, things had only just begun to get worse for the colonists, where they would begin to see things as they slept. Things that clearly presented a dangerous situation, along with images so disturbing and terrifying that they would awaken from their slumber. Noticing some strange readings coming from the wilderness just outside of the colony, inside of a ravine, Jennifer Barrow would lead her team of surveyors to investigate the strange readings at the request of her superiors. She would move further and further through the barren and darkened wastelands the planet had to offer until the team had discovered a set of markings engraved into the rock wall that appeared to have been made by an E-34 drilling rig. However, one of the team members would remark that those rigs hadn't been used in over 200 years. Just as Jennifer was to report these findings, the others would call her over as they had found something unexpected. Through the cave system, she would see the glow of something lurking within a large chamber. The light had been coming from a monolith that held glyphs or symbols engraved into it, similar to that of the rock walls. Hey, Commander, everyone, heads up! The hell is that? But just hold on there, Commander, while I consult my book of weird shit. Everyone's a comedian. That's nothing to laugh about. Are we patched through? Barrow, this is Cortez in PSEC. Is that... Can that possibly be what I think it is? I don't know, Detective. Depends on how fucked up your thoughts are, I guess. After reporting the findings of her discovery, Jennifer and her team marked the site for Carfusia, and he would shut down the excavation preparations in the area, which would upset some of the workers who had their shifts cut off. At this time, Nicole would be accommodated on board the USG Ishimura, which had arrived after the completion of the task in the HAT P1B system, where it had cracked the planet Magor not too long ago. At this time, a miner known as Harris would be reeling from the effects of insomnia, so much so he pays Dr. Skyrello a visit in order to get something to help with his sudden impairment. I can't sleep. A lot of it going around. How long you been on colony? Since day one, why? I've seen this before. For the past two and a half years, you guys have done all the work. Done all the excavation prep. Yeah, so? And then the Ishimura shock points in at the last minute and grabs all the glory. Enough to make anyone depressed, really. I ain't depressed. I just can't sleep. Sure, sure. Look, all I can do is prescribe you some sedative pills. That's 20 cases in three days. Have you really seen this before? <laughs> Something damn strange is going on around here. At the same time, in the Union Square of the Aegis Seven colony, Deacon Abbott would be spreading his gospel truth of Michael Altman to the public, due to the recent discovery of the Red Marker. For 200 years, Unitology has sought the truth. When Michael Altman spread his word, few people believed him. The government tried to discredit him. But that didn't work. They killed him and said it was an accident. But we also know he was telling the truth. For two centuries, we and our forefathers kept the faith and our belief in his words. Now, finally, we have proof that we have been right all along. You've all seen the vidlogs by now. You all know what they found out there. Here on this very planet, we found another marker. Yeah, I thought the mark was supposed to be black. This thing's red. You mean, I'm just saying, this guy's a, what, a priest or something? Deacon Abbott, BTM engineer first class. And yes, lay preacher. Who are you? Newman, PSEC. 
You can't hide the truth, Mr. Newman. That's what they tried to do when they killed Altman. But we're still here. Uh, don't be stupid. CEC doesn't give a shit about some fringe nut job. Graham, that's enough. Oh, come on. This is the last straw. You can't seriously buy this crap. Buy? Damn it, this is my fate. There is no goddamn marker. Sure, that thing out there is some weird shit. Maybe it isn't even human. But in case you hadn't noticed, we already conquered heaven. And guess what? God wasn't home. Your God, perhaps. Our God is very much in residence. Carfugia at this time would tell the comms relay team to begin transmitting to the CEC headquarters on Earth, informing them of the recent discovery and they would contact the church, who tells them that it must be delivered to them at once. And so they begin preparations to send the USG Ishimura to the planet to first recover the lost artifact and then to finish by cracking the planet and breaking it down before returning to the headquarters. Outside, in the wilderness, the workers begin prepping and building a rail connecting the marker to the rest of the colony as an extension so that when the time comes, it can be extracted. However, one of the workers is clearly annoyed that they got the short end of the stick with them looking after the marker. After clearing the ravine, the workers would name the sector as Digsite GL-426. Meanwhile, Newman and Cortez would get a report of an assault in progress from Dispatch, who directs them to Dr. Skyrello's office. Dispatch, drop the cutter! This fucking crack tried to con me! He said the pills would make me sleep, but they don't! Every night I lie there and these things, these things I think about. I don't want to, but I can't stop it! Hey, hey, listen to me. You're stressed out, I know, but this is not going to help you. Just give me the cutter and let's talk about this. No, you're lying! Ah! Uh, Come here, you crazy son of a uh, bitch! Doc, you alright? Yes, I'm fine, just a little sh Doc, what is it? Katie! After getting the clearance to begin their voyage into the unknown, Captain Matthias sends out a long-range transmission to the office of the colony manager, Carfusia, where the two exchange information about the higher authority that had authorized the extraction of the marker. Soon after the discussion, Deacon Abbott takes a couple of his men to the dig site behind Carfusia's back to which the others state that they should have asked for permission first. But Deacon tells them to relax, since when did they need permission to just take a walk? To be ahead, that way, and just ever clears. There! Holy shit! Beautiful! At last, a real marker! At it! What are you doing? Don't touch it! Relax, Joe. Who knows how long this thing is? Centuries, maybe millennia. You see, nothing to be scared of. This is our salvation. Of course it is. You always were smart, my dear. Mom? But you're dead! Deacon, listen. You must protect it. No! No! This isn't right. Go, go away! What are they talking to? Abbott! They want to take it. Don't. No. What just happened? I... not sure. I think you just saw the... other side. On the journey to the Aegis Cluster, the second engineer, Jay Wright, begins his repairs to the shuttles that had been damaged during the last voyage, where he would replace the four gyro of shuttle USG-ish-503. Captain Matthias at this time would send for Dr. Kine, who had been looking at the recent video logs for the colony. Kine would tell Matthias that the marker appears to be genuine, right down to the tiniest detail. Even though the quality of the video feed was poor, the pair would rejoice in being the ones to recover the secrets the marker would share with them, and EarthGov wouldn't be able to get in their way this time. 
During the first week of the voyage to Aegis Seven, Benjamin Matthias would be in his quarters when he would receive a message from Phoebe Tremaine, who had been the sanctified messenger in the fleet section and security for the Church of Unitology. She would congratulate the captain for this great honor and that upon his arrival to the church with the holy artifact in their hands, his body will have a reserved spot in the church's cryogenic fleet to be amongst the most blessed of all, including Michael Altman himself. However, this was to be conditional, as if he failed, this honor would be taken away. So needless to say, this would pressure the captain to get in and out of the system as soon as possible. Nicole at this time would be finishing her shift in the wards of the medical deck when she would feel the need to give Isaac a call. Isaac, are you there? Come in, Isaac. Oh, God. I'm so sorry, Isaac. Look at the time difference. No, no, I'll call you back okay. later. It's okay. How are you doing? Good. You're right, Isaac. The Ishmer is a great ship. I am so lucky to be serving aboard her. Until it while last, you know they're going to decommission her next year. Isaac. Thank you. For what? For just pushing me to do this. I mean, if it weren't for you, I never would have made it this far, because you made me stick with it. I'll just remember, I'm giving you up for six months so you can do this. The following day, Jay Wright would be replacing a faulty 40 scope on the shuttle USG-ish-501, with the procedures taking longer than expected which would extend out into the following days, where he would make other repairs to the shuttle 505, which possessed damaged landing repulsors and a damaged booster collar, along with shuttle 504 that had damaged the fore and left fore viewpoints, which had been successfully repaired on their way to the planet. At this time, Dr. Skyrello would be holding a press conference to mourn the passing of his colleague, Katie, who had been the receptionist that was killed in the hostage struggle with Harris. Katie was my assistant for five years. She was devoted to her job, but that devotion got Katie killed. As you know, everyone's stressed right now. You can't sleep, you have bad dreams when you do. Katie saved my life. If she hadn't called PSEC, I'd be lying in the morgue right now. I'd gladly make that exchange. And I- I know you would, Tom. Katie? But there are more important things that you have to do, Tom. You've gotta stop them. No. No, this isn't real. Tom, are you all right? Sorry, folks. Tom's not feeling too good. Thanks for coming. Oh, Christ, she's gone. The following day, Newman pays a visit to his partner's apartment to find out if she will be coming to work. However, he would claim that her excuses sounded like the rest of the miners that had been arrested in the last week. He then began jesting about the marker sending visions to her, which would be the straw that broke the camel's back, and she would send him on his way before sliding the door in on his face. Carfuja at this time would be informed of a disturbance at the dig site, where he would confirm to Deacon Abbott that the market is to be left alone. Regardless of what had been said to him, Deacon once again takes a dozen or so people to see the marker to experience the artifact in all of its glory, where they would be stopped by Natalia Deshinov, to which Deacon complains at first, but then quietly accepts to stay back with his followers as they are patiently waiting to bask in the essence of the marker. However, at the same time, unexpectedly, Newman and Dr. Skyrello are traveling towards the marker in search of answers. However, all they find is confusion to add to those many questions. There you go. Holy shit. Now I see it with my own eyes. What's going on here? I heard about this. Pilgrim's coming out to worship. Sorry, guys. This is as close as you get. You want to join the prayers? 
Uh, it's leading a group over there. Can't say I'm surprised. Cortez? You're supposed to be laid up sick. Abbott said I should come here instead. And I feel better already. This is crazy. What the fuck happened? Honestly, I feel sorry for you. You don't understand what you're missing. I know exactly what this bullshit is about. I lost my wife to your fucking hey. cult, remember? Hey! Is there a problem here? No, Carl. My partner just hasn't seen the light yet. Seen the light? If Commander James catches you out here, all you're gonna see is your severance. You're coming back with me, Cortez. I'm booking you in for a psych eval. No! Let go of her! Hey, you guys! You're supposed to be guarding this thing! Give me some backup here! You're disturbing the prayer room. You should leave. What? It's these idiots who should leave. No, I don't think so. Now get back in your crawler and go home. Oh, what the fuck just happened? I don't know, but I don't want to be around it a second longer. Soon after the event, Dr. Skyrello begins to send his findings on the sudden increase of mental health issues to Dr. Kine via long-range transmissions, and the records begin to trouble him, but not enough to raise any major concerns, as he begins to think of the same conclusions that Dr. Skyrello had raised before with radiation, or perhaps a contaminated water or food supply was to blame here. Meanwhile, someone at the marker site begins to record a live feed with a handheld device with the rig signature being whited out, which makes Carfusia furious at the sudden interference. As Carver goes out into the dig site to apprehend Natasha, Newman and his commander strongly urge Carfusia to make the preparations to pull out of the system. We need to just leave that thing alone and get the hell out of here. Officer Newman. Sergeant. This is a very important find. Important enough for people to die. You're reaching, Commander. Some miners get the colony crazies, and suddenly it's because we found the rock. Don't pull that shit with me, Hanford. We got two dead already, and things are only getting worse. I strongly advise you call CEC and tell them we're pulling out. Let me get this straight. This operation has already cost hundreds of billions over two and a half years. Aegis 7 has trillions worth of saleable resources. But now, less than three weeks from planet crack, you want me to abort because a couple of miners died. I'll be very clear, Commander. Not a chance. Besides, you'll get your wish. Just be patient. What are you talking about? In four days' time, the artifact will be lifted and brought here to await the Ishimura. When the ship arrives, it will be transferred on board. You're bringing it into the colony. How much fucking damage do you want to do? Don't get hysterical, Sergeant. Are you blind? Goodbye, gentlemen. Thanks for your input. <sighs> what the hell do we do now? Brace ourselves. Hans Legio at this time had been succumbing to the voices traveling through his mind, and he would eventually fall into a state of dementia where he needed to kill his dig team, said the voices, and he obeyed the command. However, Pisek would be there to stop the attack before he could kill more, and they would place him in a holding cell. On the day of the extraction operation, Newman and Dr. Skyrello begin talking about the incidents and that Carfusia has allowed the doctor to talk to Natasha about the marker. However, inside the Eastern Sector Vehicle Maintenance Bay, Deacon continues to preach about the marker's plan to prepare them for the coming days ahead. Inside Natasha's room, Dr. Skyrello begins making his observations when she would tell him of her dreams, what she sees even when she can't sleep, before pleading with him that it's not safe that they have to leave the planet as she begins getting aggressive with him and a guard moves in, knocking her down. But unexpectedly, she continues pleading, pleading that they should kill her now before it's too late, which confuses the pair even more so. On the bridge of the USG Ishimura, a unitologist known as Warren Eckhart talks to the captain about cycling the work shifts around, 
so that at least one unitologist would be present in each key location all around the ship's decks, along with allowing him access to the colony for another special operation of the church to find an individual that seems immune to the marker's reach. After some time to consider what the man had to offer, the captain would accept and agrees with him, giving Eckhart everything he needed to exact the plan, which may have been to place a single unitologist in each location in hopes it would bring more into the folds of the church. In a sort of Trojan horse type of exchange, Eckhart would find that his clearance level had been elevated to executive now, giving him command of the working schedules. Some time later, Newman gets a call to investigate a rally at Union Square, where the unitologists are gathering. And at this time, Lexine calls Sam Cordwell before his shift on reclaiming the lost artifact. That's better. Uh, sorry, Lexine, I was next to the recharging station. Are you calling about tonight? No, because then it wouldn't be a surprise. I'm mad at you, Sam Caldwell. Why? Because you somehow forgot to tell me what you're doing today. It's just a routine excavation. Routine? You're extracting a marker. My supervisor Leon's nuts with excitement. Did you know he's a unitologist? This is a big deal. Leon's always been nuts. Anyway, we don't know if it's a marker or just a big rock. That's why we're doing this, so the boffins can study it. Sam Caldwell, if you had an imagination, you'd be dangerous. We'll see about that tonight. Ooh, I look forward to it. Gotta go, honey. I love you. I love you too. Later. However, as soon as they remove the red marker from the pedestal, the entire colony would be rocked by a halting screech that would echo through to everyone, with a great and terrible pain flooding through their minds, as if feeling the anguish the marker had been too feeling. Soon after the mass suicide, the EMP strike would cause the gravity tethers to malfunction, and Sam would lead a team through the mega vents in order to fix them. However, the deeper they went down into the depths of the mega vents, the stranger things had become with miners killing themselves unexpectedly, even rushing to attack them. Sam would have no choice but to make use of the rivet gun he had, and to put these people down. But soon, the same effects began to affect his friends, who attacked him, and out of fear for his own preservation, he would kill them too. But it wouldn't be too long after fixing the tethers and the life support systems that the marker had begun to cloud his mind, and at this time others had called PSEC to report the strange and horrific activity. Sam, on the other hand, would be continuously harassed by more workers and miners, along with the voices inside his head growing louder and louder, until he sees a group of four moving in towards his direction, and due to his aggressive behavior, he would be gunned down by Nathan McNeil. As Sam fell to the floor, the visions and monsters had disappeared, leaving Sam confused as he began bleeding out onto the great slats of the mega vents. It would turn out that the only crazed individual had been him and him alone in a severe state of dementia. The guy that slaughtered his entire crew. Why'd you do it, son? All these people never did anything to her. 
Lex. He's gone. Call Commander James and get Doc Sciarella down here. He's gonna have a busy day. The following morning, as the marker was being pulled into the second North Sector inbound vehicle bay, Colin Barrow had been met with PSEC officers who wanted to question him about the extraction event, where Colin tells them about the issues they had soon after the extraction event, but the officers would then tell him of the massacre of Union Square. Back on Earth in the American Republic sector, Isaac would be informed of a tragic event to do with his father and his mother that for some unknown motive, she had murdered Paula and then committed suicide. Isaac would visit the residence they had been located at, but as soon as they had gotten there, the bodies were gone. Soon, Isaac would be approached by agents of Unitology, who confirmed that the church had rightfully taken what they believed belonged to them. As part of Octavia's pledge that upon her death and the deaths of her loved ones, the church was to take the bodies to be stored in cryogenic pods to await for convergence. Isaac would then attempt to appeal this but would be denied, which is where he would further attempt to get a petition formed, but all attempts to contact the church from him would be either denied or ignored. Distraught over the deaths and unable to wrap his head around the incident, Isaac's career would once again stagnate. In a severe state of grief, he would call Nicole to inform her of the grave news. Sorry, late shift. How are you? My, um... My mother, she's, um... Octavia? How's she doing? How's she doing? She's dead, Nicole. They both are. She killed my dad, then herself. Oh. Yeah. The church... They, uh, took the bodies before I could, uh... Oh, my God. Oh, Isaac, I'm... So sorry. Fucking so oh, told you Stop, washing. stop it. Just stop talking. You said she was herself again. You said she would be better at home. Trusted you. God. You might as well have killed him yourself. She was better. You told me to leave for the Ishimura. You, you pushed me to. You know what? Go to hell, Isaac. Nicole. Nicole! Nicole! I didn't. Oh, God. No. Not her, too. Soon after this revelation, the captain would call Carfusia to give him a new set of orders to do with the mass suicide of the Union Square. Meanwhile, in Megavent 27, under the 18th Northern Sector, Newman would respond to a call about something the maintenance workers had found on their rounds, which had been a foul-smelling, reddish blob that would react to Newman prodding it. Seeing that the organism had made its way through the ventilation system, Newman would use a blowtorch to burn the creature away so that it wouldn't block up the ventilation shafts as those would feed into the colony. As Newman returns to the BSEC headquarters, he would find that most of the staff and officers had called in sick, with only a few officers left standing. With the decline of society seeping into the colony, Newman goes to see Marla, who too called in for a headache. 
At this time, things had only begun to get worse, with the men who extracted the marker having their minds riddled with the symbols. They just couldn't stop themselves from bringing the images that they could see into the real world around them by scribbling them down onto anything nearby, and Dr. Skyrello would soon see this when he would pay the Fancher residents a visit, which would shock him so much so that he would prepare a sedative. Mr. Fancher, I'm going to give you a sedative. Nothing to worry about. No, no, get away, wasting time! Get away, get away! Mr. Fancher, please. Get away! Ah! No! Please! Kill you! Kill us! Oh, kill! Kill us! Kill You all right? I should start demanding danger, buddy. You mean you've seen other people like this? Yes. This is a growing problem. And of course, there was the suicide in Union Square. Oh, God. Yeah, I heard about that. What's going on, Doc? Is my husband going to be like this forever, or what? I wish I knew, Mrs. Fancher. Right now, seems like nobody can figure it out. Soon after this event, a fire would break out in one of the barracks, and first responders would swoop in to collect the survivors of the blaze, and to put the fires out. However, one of them, being known as Jane, saw two people on the other side of a door frame, and as she helped them through the door, it would slam shut, clamping down on her fingers, causing them to be severed. However, the doctors examined the wounds, and they determined that they would need to be sent up to the USG Ishimura to have prosthetics fitted to her nerve endings. Inside of the medical deck, on board the USG Ishimura, Nicole would be attending to one of her more secret patients, as she continues to help those who wished to be rid of unitology. However, the patient would tell Nicole that she and her girlfriend both wished to leave, but were indeed nervous to the point that they don't wish to be named. Instead, going by the alias Jane Doe in the transcript of the interview, in the counselling session, Nicole would recount the event of Octavia's death, but would reassure the woman that she will fight, not just for her, but for both of them. At that time, the colony would receive a hail from a nearby ship in low orbit, which Carfusia would be soon notified of. However, Newman barges into the office with the same arguments as before, pleading with the colony manager to stop the operation before it's too late. However, Carfusia would tell him that the boss of the operation was now Captain Matthias, who had no ill intention of stopping the crack as per his messages from the church, placing immense pressure on him. Jane at this time would arrive at the medical deck, where she and Greggs would have their official meeting, and it wouldn't be long until they set up a date together after the appointment. Any problems with uh, urination? Just balancing on one leg. Let's see, have you ever received a replacement organ or a limb before? Nope. And what about pain? Any above the hip or at the hip? Ain't got me on so many drugs, I don't feel nothing. Care to tell me what happened? Was on a power welding assignment inside the chunk perimeter. We were all making overtime because we were way behind. Hastings, our Jenny operator, was on the phone with the point foreman, not paying any attention to the plasma buildup on the Jenny. He likes to yak, that one. Anyhow, he couldn't hear us yelling at him to turn it down a notch. So I x my torch and went to cool off the Jenny myself. Then, bam! Next thing I know, my entire team is standing over me. Jerry, our metal grip, is holding my leg and screaming at me to wake up. He was crying. I look at him and say, Jerry, can you stop the goddamn crying for Christ's sake? You're a grown man. Sounds like you went into shock. Shock? I suppose. 
I passed out again, woke up on the Ishii with a weird craving for tuna salad. I hadn't eaten any in 25, 30 years. Not since I left Earth. Tuna. <laughs> Give me a cigarette. It's quite an injury, Mr. Billings. You can make a spare, though, right? I'll do my best. Please. I'm getting murdered on the comp settlement. Their taxes have taxes. I need to get back out to the chunk pronto. A lot's gonna depend on the nerve endings. Nerve endings? Yeah, they're vital to the new limb's functional capacity. That's why I ask you if it hurts. Well, my two-year-old hit the stump with his toy the other night and had me crying like his little sister. I'd say they're still there. Mm-hmm. Well, good to hear. I think we'll have you back to work before too long. Much appreciated. Let's see, Officer Gautier. I'm Technician Greggs. I've got a couple questions for you today. Please call me Jane. All right, Jane it is. Call me George. Wanna smoke? Thanks, no. So, it says here you're a hero. Congratulations. Just doing my job. But yeah, it was a big fire. Biggest we've had on A7 by far. I'm really sorry for the crew you lost. Me too. Good officers. They did save the barracks, though. Some would say that's worth the sacrifice, right? Did I just walk into a shrink's office by mistake? <laughs> yeah, why don't you tell me what happened? <sighs> All right. It was a hub apartment fire. Another domestic dispute gone haywire. About a half a dozen officers responded, including me. So we went in with IE filter goggles and pulled out about a dozen people. I heard someone shouting behind the door. It was jammed. So I called into operations. The door opened enough to where I could force it the rest of the way, but as the two people slid past, the door got grumpy on me and slammed shut on my hand. Just as the fire was moving closer. Lucky for me, the pain from the burns helped me get over the smashed hand. Does it still hurt? To talk about it? No. Not the first time a P-Sex needed some spare parts. Won't be the last. Now, I mean your hand. See, growing the limbs is simple enough. But successful attachment relies on the quality of the remaining nerve endings. You follow? You mean if I can't feel anything, my new fingers will just be jewelry? I won't be able to use them? Exactly. So, Jane, does it hurt? Yes, George. It hurts. Hurts like a bitch, actually. <laughs> All right. I'm glad that you could be- Technician Greggs, please report to trauma. Technician Greggs, to trauma. Sorry. Would you mind if we schedule a second appointment to complete the interview? Sure. How about over a drink? Uh, that's not what I meant. I was... We both look like we could use one. All right, then. I'll buzz you tomorrow. After going through the records of the attacks, the cases of dementia, and the strange occurrences, Dr. Kine would talk with Dr. Mercer, who also has seen the reports, and they both conclude that they need to gain access to the patients, Hans Legio and Brandt Harris, to be put under further analysis to which Dr. Kine attempts to get the captain to listen to reason by claiming that the situation on the planet is too unprecedented to act incautiously, that they need to study the cause and effects. He continues to further add that they should either bring Doctors Skyrello and Welland aboard, or that Mercer and Kine should go down to consult with them about the illnesses, and their observations on the patients could be invaluable to which the captain denies the reach, and tells him that the two patients will be coming aboard to be treated for their dementia, with the bodies that are to be stored, and the marker will be under Kine's supervision for his personal study. Jane and Greggs would be on the observation deck at this time, enjoying their time together, and soon the date would be over, and the work to reworking her prosthetic fingers to her nerve endings would be underway the following day. 
just as this was to be happening, First Officer White had been compiling all the recent data on the shift changes and the amount of unitologists on board to add to his own records. He would then write in the record that he checked the recent files on the bridge to find the origin point of how so many unitologists had been on board at this time and in the specific locations they had been assigned to, which would lead him back to Warren Eckhart. Dr. Cross at the time would be preparing a food supply to go down to the colony so that the colonists would be filled to the brim with food after the long haul. But to her surprise, the captain soon dismissed the procedure and told them to stand down, that he will be soon issuing a no-fly order from planet side to the USG Ishimura. Hydroponics log, Dr. Elizabeth Cross. Now that sprinklers are fixed, we're working close to maximum capacity. All flora is thriving and food yield has created a surplus. I had the surplus packed up so we could send it to the colony. But Captain Matthias is strictly enforcing his no-fly order. It's ridiculous. I'm lodging a complaint. Everyone knows Aegis 7 needs help. What harm could some fresh fruit do? <laughs> Suddenly, all colonists who had been brought up from the planet would be sent back down to the planet, as per the no-fly order, as ordered by Captain Matthias. While this had been going on, Newman and Dr. Skyrello had been moving towards Natasha's room, who has appeared to have been calmed down to the point where she had been relocated out of the psych ward. After looking at the walls, Newman rushes to find Marla so that she can snap out of her study. But as soon as he does, he gets another call from the supervisor down in the mega vents, telling him of the corrupted, foul-smelling blob, where Newman guesses that it has regrown. But he could never have guessed or even imagined that it had spread as far as it had done so. Soon, Warren would be making his approach to the planet on board a shuttle. However, this one was to be a different make of the normal planet cracker shuttles. Meanwhile, Carfusia would be in his office talking with the captain about bringing all the patients and murdered victims. But as soon as he had told Carfusia that he would not be attending the USG Ishimura, Carfusia would furiously tell the captain to breach his own orders and get the suicide victims himself before shutting the video log off. During the night, Marla joins Newman at Natasha's new room, where they can see all of the scriptures of the marker littered all over the walls. Holy shit. She did this all herself? Yeah, I've seen you hunched over that vidlog enough times to know you'd want to see it. Damn straight. Natalia, what are you writing? Is it a message? No, don't understand. They don't know. Good. It's no good. Too late. Death is the key. You don't understand. We can never go back. Completely unaware of what they had just brought on board, the captain goes to the comms array to send a transmission outward to the Church of Unitology. Progress report, Captain Benjamin Matthias to Paragon Jordan, Una. This will be my last transmission. Afterwards, I'll make sure our pilgrimage can be completed without interference. We have successfully brought the Holy Marker on board. Dr. Kine, an expert on the original marker, is deciphering its secrets. Uh, forgive me for quarantining you just seven. Director Eckhart's work may have been inconvenienced, but they're suffering some sort of epidemic. Regardless, Planet Crack begins tomorrow on schedule. <laughs> CEC can scratch out its illegal operation now that the true prize is ours. Let's see Earth go try to cover this up. Altman be praised. But I saw.
crew of the USG Ishimura all begin to reel from the effects of the marker, with them all feeling the stress of the insomnia, depression and dementia. However, there had been bigger issues at play here with many of the crew beginning to see an organic material seeping through the vents and into the decks all across the ship. The personnel would talk to medical and the scientists wouldn't be able to gain a grasp on what it is. Back on the planet, Newman would show the same to the colony manager, hoping to reach some sense with Carfusia, showing the corruption clinging and spreading all over the mega vents. However, Carfusia, in a state of low hope, tells him that they are staying the course before asking him to leave, as he has preparations to make. Captain Matthias orders Alyssa Vincent to send a squad down to the planet to retrieve the bodies, and she gives the order to Gabe Weller and tells him to relax, that it was a small mission and that he should rejoice as he has a friend down there. But she soon also tells him to not scare the rookie. As the marker is placed in the flight deck, Dr. Kine would remark on what secrets it has in store for them when he is suddenly called away from the flight deck and to the medical lab, where they have an emergency with one of the patients. Once he arrives, he is shown that Hans is still awake, even though the nurse had given him a sedative, but he appears to be fighting it. Hans then slips out of his restraints and begins beating himself in the side of his head with blood splattering on the bed. They then hold him down and sedate him once more, which soon does the trick. Other doctors and scientists begin to raise questions about the sudden cases of insomnia and depression. Dr. Kine and Dr. Mercer then begins a meeting, telling them that they have the situation under control and that they will find the underlying cause of all of this. At this time, Dr. Warwick would make a note about the rising cases of the sleep paralysis hallucinations, nightmares, and paranoia. However, he was unable to find anything that indicated what had been happening to the miners and the personnel, but at least the zero-g therapy had been holding up, giving the doctor hope that even though they aren't fully aware of what is causing this to happen, at least something can be done to dull the effects of such a cause. Warwick, however, would worry about what could happen if a power surge were to occur in inside of the zero-g pods. What then? But he would reassure himself that he would rather take a small, calculated risk rather than sending the miners and engineers on their way while being impaired around heavy machinery. Soon after this, the time would come to evaluate the patient Brant Harris, in which Dr. Warwick would find that Harris had sociopathic tendencies, with him being able to recall the event to the smallest detail, but when questioned about the nurse, Harris would claim that she wasn't a nurse at the time of her death claiming there was no crime to be reported on. When Warwick questions him further, Harris would claim that the question is stuck within his mind, and when he would try to talk about the message, it would mix it all up. Harris would then claim that the dreams need to speak, and that they needed it to make it whole again. At the end of the evaluation, Dr. Warwick puts Harris to sleep, as without a sedative, Brandt couldn't sleep on his own, which would further puzzle the doctor, who thought on how an average person would collapse after 50 hours of waking due to sleep deprivation, but not him, not Harris. Dr. Warwick would then move Harris over to Nicole and allow her to treat him. After consulting with Dr. Warwick, Dr. Kine would then approach Dr. Mercer where they would discuss the matter of Brandt Harris together to better understand what their next course of action might be. Meanwhile, second engineer Jay Wright would invite M. Smith to join him and the others for a night of poker, and Smith would accept. However, it would soon come at a cost, as Smith could not stand that a member of their group, Pavi, who had been very talkative about the dreams he kept on having about a fellow worker who had been decapitated in an accident, with the dream showing Sarossi walking around, normal, 
despite not possessing a head. Smith had told Wright that it had gotten to the point where he began to have dreams of his own, where he would wake up to see his father sitting at his bedside. While working throughout this day, however, Smith could see his father out the corner of his eye, just standing there. Where many would think this to be a good thing, Smith hadn't been very fond of his father and quoted that he needs to stay dead. Back on the planet in the PSEC headquarters, Nathan McNeil would soon meet someone who would make his day even more interesting, Gabe Weller. Detective Nathan McNeil. Well, I'll be damned. Gabe Weller. When I requested help from the Ishimura, I didn't realize they had you on board. Transferred six months ago. It's been a long time, Nate. It's good to see you. No, it's been hell down here. Some extra hands will come in useful. Sorry, no cop duty. We have an errand. An errand? Gabe, we've got assaults, murder, suicides, almost 60 dead and dozens injured. Nobody here has ever seen anything like it. I just can't cope. Cope? Wasn't it you who pulled me out of a three-way firefight on Scorpio 6 and then went back into Plant Limpets? And now some crazy miners have got you losing sleep? It's not that simple. So what is this errand anyway? Baines! Hutchins! Hey, you too, rookie. We need to get to the morgue. Think you can cope with giving us direction? I'll take you. I have to drop this off at evidence anyhow. What do you want with the morgue? The captain sent us to retrieve the bodies from the Union Square suicide before they pop the cork on the planet. But keep it quiet, okay? Oh, sure. Your crew's really inconspicuous. You gonna introduce us? Baines and Hutchins, two of my best. Detective. A pleasure. And Carklin's here as my rookie. It's an honor, sir. Sergeant Weller speaks highly of you. <laughs> Jeez. Don't let him fill your head with his macho tails, son. Baines, Hutchins, go prep the shuttle and wait for us. Yes, sir. All right, All right. follow me. Newman soon visits Marla's apartment, hoping that she had stopped looking into the symbols on what they mean. However, to his surprise, it had just motivated her to continue, and he would walk to the observation tower by himself. Progressive stable alpha. Gravity tethers 13 through 16, status green. Geostat AV is in place, confirmed final. Roger that, ground. Stand by. All tether locks confirmed. Oh yes, correct and green. This is Glider 2. All systems look good. Roger that, Glider 2. Control, this is Glider 1. We have confirmed operational final. All units standing by. All right, Mr. White. Pop the cork. Roger that, Control. 3. Let's crack this sucker. 2. Oh, shit. Oh, wow. 1. Mark. Man, I love this part. Planet crack initiated. 1,200 local standard time. We are go. Repeat. We are go. Brandon Farland. Marla, come in. Bram, are you there? You've got to hear this. It's... Shit. Hmm. Control, this is Newman. What the hell just happened? Control, come in. Damn it. Oh! Where the hell are the backup generators? Ah! Can you... There's no time to run. Just trying to warn you. Now it's too late. Backups must be shot. There's a fucking engineer. Ah, damn it. Trams too, betcha. Pete, that clear the goddamn way. Calms down too? Jesus, can't they keep anything up for more than a day? Hey Lambert, you got any light down there? No comms. So it fucked it. Well, hello? Lambert, damn it, if you've fallen asleep, I will kick your ass. Come on, man, I can hear you. What's going on? What the? Looks like you dropped something here. Great. You know how much these things cost? Jesus. Will you just get out of here and quit screwing around? As the outbreak of the planet begins, the USG Ishimura gets hit by a large surge of electromagnetic energy coursing out from the planet, and the marker begins to pulse its signal even more so than before, cutting off communication between the planet's cracker and the colony. Danvers at this time would be investigating into the corruption filling the decks that had continued to seep through the internal mechanisms of the ship. 
and had even begun to break through doors and walls. He would put all of his findings into writing, describing the look and smell of the organic mass. This is where he would begin to head down to the mining deck to pick up a flamethrower, thinking that if the tool were designed to break down ice in deep space mining, then it should make short work of this infestation. At the same time, due to the confusion in the medical deck, the scientists had given the reports to Professor Jaegerwald, who would begin to study the material harvested from the corruption, and he would work with Catherine Howell in order to better understand what is causing this. But what they had found was the corruption had resembled some sort of DNA, like a viral bacteria. They had also found that the organism infects other cells through osmosis, then mutates and reproduces at unbelievable speeds, regenerating at a blink of an eye. Another professor known as Hawley would produce a theory that the organism is a habitat changer, producing gases, which is why the growth would smell rotten and decayed. Unfortunately, the professors couldn't find the origin point and claimed that there must have been several points of origin scattered throughout the ship. Professor Jaeger World would then claim it to be a genuine alien life form. He would then attempt to contact Elizabeth Cross to see what she could make of their combined research. Back on the planet, things had only just been getting worse as the outbreak created chaos in its wake. As Nathan and Gabe managed to escape the clutches of the crazed colonists and had retreated back to the PSEC headquarters. Further down the halls, Jane had recorded a live feed message to be sent to Greg's as the interference had been too great, so that the pair could talk on their recent relationship. How the day and night they spent together had been great for what it was, but she needed to be realistic and had broken up with him. Suddenly, a necromorph would appear from nowhere, and the transmission would end as soon as she had been gutted from the approaching slasher. Newman at this point had managed to find Marla, and the two would rush towards the PSEC headquarters through the blood-soaked districts. Carfusia at this time would attempt to contact the Ishimura, however he would find that his appeal for a hail would fall on deaf ears. Newman and Marla would soon find themselves within the main offices of the PSEC headquarters. Near the same time as McNeil had been finding his way back to them, just in a different part of the station, Marla would then begin talking about the recombinant side of the necromorph's biology to Newman when they would get a live demonstration. That is disgusting. The body's already dead. What's the point? Come in, p for God's sake, is anyone there? Come in! This is p -Tex. I'm sorry, but we've got a situation here too. I can't... We're dying down here! We're being attacked! They're coming in! Attack? I who? Fuck! This thing's moving! Get out! What the hell is it doing? It wasn't going to me. It wants another cook. Dead bodies, remember? It's making more. Reproducing! That is some sick shit. Carthusia. Next time I see you, I swear I will kill you myself! As McNeil and Gabe fought their way through the headquarters, they would find a survivor of the attack, Lexine Murdoch, who had been hiding from the anarchy of the outbreak. Thanks for the help. Who the hell are you? Easy, Weller. She's not PSEC. I'm McNeil. What's your name? Lexine. Lexine Murdoch. Well, Lexine. You're a lucky girl. Lucky? My boyfriend was killed last week. My father's gone missing, and now this? Wait a second. I recognize you. You're Sam Caldwell's emergency contact. Sam was my boyfriend. Listen, I'm sorry about what happened. What are you doing here? My father's missing. He disappeared at the same time all those unitologists killed themselves. I came to see if there was any news, but then those things came in and started killing everyone. What's happening? I'm not sure, but it's not good for anyone. Ishimura, the colony is under attack from unknown hostiles. Come in, goddammit! 
orbital comms must have gone down with the rest of the electrics. We're on our own. Wait. You're from the ship? Yes. Special Security Task Force. Then why don't we just go there? You must have a shuttle, right? She's right. Baines and Hutchins will be waiting for us. Come on, McNeil. Wait. What about me? Go home, lock yourself up, and sit tight. Home? Are you crazy? I've lost everyone. Sorry, sweetheart, but you can't you know, come with PSEC's us. PSEC's pretty decimated. We can't handle another missing persons case. What are you talking about? Which is why you should come with us. Right, Sergeant? She's your responsibility. Fine. Let's go. As this had been happening, Carfusia would then overhear a Necromov skulking its way towards him when the colony manager would tell it to take him before it plunges its blades straight through the back of his chest. Once the man goes limp, the slasher continues moving through the halls, wearing an infector as a coat while it looks for more victims. Dr. Mercer at this time had begun to hear the voices and whispers of the marker, and soon he would begin to see new ways of doing things, new techniques to use, but he would also interpret a way to use the regenerative abilities the corruption had possessed. He would first obtain a large sample of the tissue before reducing it into a formula to which he believed that it would allow those exposed to it to inherit the abilities of the corruption. All he needed now was a suitable test subject. There. I have to record these days. Um, the old memory, you know. As I was saying, the new treatment I'm developing should be just a ticket. The trial is very promising. T trial? Uh, you'll be back at your post in the jiffy with CEC none the wiser. Unless... You don't trust me. No, uh, of course I trust you. Let's uh, give it a shot. <coughs> Volunteer 9 is a young male, <coughs> testing my new tissue regeneration formula. I expect death within the hour, but the changes to the vascular system are very promising. One moment for the cleanup. <clears throat> for the last time, get a trauma team in here. Yes, I called three times. My patient is crashing. Get off your smoke break and help me. In the chaos of the colony, Dr. Cyrello manages to find Dr. Welland and the two rush towards the med lab, picking up more doctors and nurses on their way. Once they arrive, however, they soon see the bodies had been moved, only seeing the makeshift morgue be in a bloody and vacant room. After talking about the decision of Carfusia not allowing the bodies to be taken up to the orbiting vessel, they would begin suiting up with Dr. Cyrello thinking it was going to be a long night, which he was correct, just not for him, when he would feel something drip onto him, and once he looked up, he could see a group of slashers tumbling through the vent before one impales the good doctor through the head. As Gabe, McNeil, and Lexine fight their way through the districts, Newman and Marla would find their way to the tram stations. However, they see that it had been flooded with panicking colonists. Natasha, however, would go the opposite route, intending on being made whole, with one colonist saying how it's her funeral if she continues. And she would reply, yes, I suppose it is. As they waited for the tram to leave and another to take its place, a slasher form managed to kill the conductor and Newman and Marla would instruct the others to follow them to the shuttle bay as the exercise will do all of them some good. At this time, Nicole would feel pressured as Dr. Mercer had been asking to see Brant Harris for his own research. 
However, every time he asked, she would refuse the request. However, she would begin thinking of filing a formal complaint, as she isn't about to lose another patient to unitology, even when Harris had been doing so well in zero-G therapy. On their travels, Marla and Newman lead the group of survivors to the access ways. However, what they soon saw on the other side of the bulkhead doors disturbs them to their core. Didn't sound such a bad idea to me. No. Everyone come on through, quick. Are you insane? Those things are... Those things are too busy with the body. He's right, they'll ignore it. But we have to hurry. Why do we have to hurry? Are they eating the... That's actually worse. What could be worse than eating dead people? Shh, keep your voice down. Wait, wait. What? Alonzo. Hey, hold on, buddy. No, get back here. Get out! Get for dinner. Quit screwing around and get back here. We don't have time for this. Fuck you. Pete's coming with us. What? What the fuck is that? It's time. It's a sign that we just ran out of time. What? Natasha at the time makes her way into a crawler and begins to travel across the wilderness, driving it towards the edge of the crack. Inside the shuttle bay, the colonists are all rushing aboard, so much so that they begin exceeding the weight restrictions, and one shuttle falls back into the bay, destroying the rest of the shuttles and killing a hundred people in the event. This is Sergeant Bram Newman, PSEC evacuation report. The shuttle's gone. Took off and then crashed right back down into the bay. Took a whole crowd with it. Must be a hundred people dead. We've lost the rest of the shuttles. God help us. There's no way out. Anyone hearing this, do not land. I repeat, do not land on Aegis 7. Fuck the Ishimura. They left us to die. which had been Warren Eckhart, Wait. who had been heading to the shuttle bay as the crash occurred. However, as soon as they had managed to find an alternate solution to their problem, they would be attacked by swarms of necromorphs, until Nathan had hacked the panel for the elevator, and they soon descended down into the mega vents, which looked like an entirely new hell for them to traverse. Marla and Newman, on the other hand, would too come up with an alternate plan of action, and that was to go to the comms tower to try and get into contact with the Ishimura before all is lost. While the outbreak had been occurring, Dr. Kine had been researching through the recent logs that had been sent up prior to the planet's crack and he would find that 40% of the colony had fallen due to these strange spikes of mental illnesses, and once he was out of theories, he would go to meet Dr. Mercer, who had been in surgery at this time. So Dr. Kine would leave a message behind where he would grant Dr. Mercer the privilege of questioning Brant Harris. Dr. Kine would then redirect Nicole's efforts towards the ER wing. You were in surgery, so I left this with Warwick. He'll be discreet. I just got the latest report from Aegis 7. The situation's worse than Captain Matthias will admit. 40% of the colony's population is now showing symptoms. Depression, hallucinations, more violence. People are dying down there. I know it's linked to the marker somehow, but I just don't have enough data. Or sir, maybe I was wrong. We need answers by any means possible. That patient, Brad Harris, might be our last hope. Down inside the mining deck, Dallas had begun reporting on the first part of the continental mass being successfully processed, refined, and smelted. 
as Marla and Newman found their way to the comms tower, they soon found that they might not be alone as they had fought when observing the open door from around the corner. However, as soon as they had entered, they would find what they believed to be the root sum of their issues with the communications. The corruption had managed to spread to the internal machinery and had blocked off certain access ways, one of which would contain Vera's face, which would make Newman freeze with shock as his partner's face came back to haunt him, as if making good with her promise. However, Marla would then see more necromorphs coming in to join on the horror show. You better hope that door lock's not busted. Marla, come on! I'm right behind you! Oh. Marla! Yeah. No, no, no! Oh, Marla. Oh. Captain Matthias at this time would begin to grow suspicious and would attempt to gain some leverage as to what had been happening on the colony and so the crew contacts Colin Barrow who had been inside a shuttle at the time of the outbreak which had spared him from the horrors. However, the interference proved too great and Colin had decided to return to base with his colleague. As Colin had made his way through the apartment blocks, he would hear the ominous sound echoing out towards him, screams followed by loud roars. He would begin running away from these sounds until he reached his quarters. Dr. Kine would be on the bridge at this time, and he would inform the captain of what he has learned from his research on the marker, but Matthias would dismiss the claims. However, as soon as he does, they regain contact with the colony, just over a couple of hours later on from the initial planet's crack. However, they soon see the devastation from the camera feed with blood, bodies, and some more of the corruption filling the district's barracks and other key locations. But no signs of necromorph presence. Alyssa, however, began to protest, saying how they need to send an additional security team down there. But as soon as she had said that, the flat lines on the rig systems came flooding in, leading Kine to remark on the colonists being slaughtered. The captain goes into full alert, and he soon declines Alyssa's demand that she goes down there, as he says he needs a sit rep ASAP. As this is happening, Colin Barrow begins running to his ship with his wife in his arms before turning back towards the corridor to see that his footsteps had attracted the attention of whatever had been lurking within the darkness. But as he preps the shuttle to head to the Ishimura, he fails to notice that one of his pursuers had managed to stow away on board. At this time, McNeil, Lexine, Warren and Gabe had managed to find their way to another shuttle, along with Blaine and Hutchins being slightly ahead of them, when all of a sudden a tentacle bursts forth from the floor plating they had been standing on, killing the two officers in an instant. Gabe and the others then make a mad dash for the shuttle in an attempt to do what Colin had done so. It's not working. They must have changed the go. Oh, shit. Stand back, I'll hack it. Hurry up, we'll cover you. Got it. Everybody, get inside. Now. Don't just stand there, Sergeant. Come on! Good work, soldier. This is bigger than we thought. Relax. It's dead. Eckhart, get up here and second me. I can fly, but I don't know survey craft. Thank you, Nate. Without you, we wouldn't have got this far. Don't mention it. Ah! 
Gordon's not dead. Go, get him! At this time, Dr. Mercer would see the colony feed from Jurgens, and he would spot a miner going through the transformation period, which inspires him to begin more research into the Necromorphs. With the sample of the corruption in hand, he continues to make his serum for cellular regeneration. Surgical log, Dr. Charles Mercer, copy to my secure terminal. I convinced Jurgens to show me the video feed from the colony. It's remarkable to finally see what I've sought all my life. The miners, this transformation, the divide death itself. Kain is erring on the side of caution. His faith has been shaken by these necromorphs, as he calls them. How strange, when my own faith has been so richly rewarded. With or without Kain, I must study one of these creatures. Or the next best thing. Brennan's patient, for example. On the bridge deck, the crew begin to see a shuttle on their monitors, which happens to be the one belonging to Colin, who is warned not to approach the Ishimura due to the no-fly order. Shuttle 7, this is the Ishimura. You are ordered to return to the surface immediately. Do you read me? You cannot land on board the Ishimura. Over! Fuck you, Ishimura! Landing, crashing, or shot down! Pick one! And there's no way out! As Vincent and her team prepare to head down to the flight deck, the Necromorphs flee into the vents and make their escape. Meanwhile, a few shuttles manage to make it past the debris field and past the threshold of the tectonic load, where the Ishimura would hail them, but this time, they would take no chances. There's the Ishimura. They're hailing us. USG Ishimura to all shuttles. You are violating a direct no-fly order. Return to planet side immediately. This is shuttle CSO-4. The colony's overrun. We can't go back. Now listen here. I am Warren Eckhart, executive director of Colonial Mining Operations. I repeat, clearance to land is denied. Any approach will be considered hostile. Hostile? Is he insane? Fuck that! We're coming in! Holy shit! to something. Main thrust is a fright. We're gonna die. We're in even worse shape than this. McNeil, intercept that cannon fire. We're setting it down on the Ishimura's hull. Brace yourselves! We're too fast! Mind those blasts! Jesus! Yes! Yes! Here we go! Jesus! 
In this moment, inside of the food storage chamber, Dr. Cross would hear the shuttle crashing and would go to those injured from the sudden decompression, but she would soon find that they are not as alone as they had thought. The corruption now had taken on a new form. Hello, security. This is Dr. Cross in hydroponics. Something just hit the hull near food storage. We think it's a rogue asteroid. I have people injured from decompression. We need medics and crowd control right away. Oh my god. What the hell is this? Everyone out of food storage. It's alive. How can it be alive? Soon Hans awakens from his chemically aided slumber and sees that the area has been left alone. As he steps outside, he feels something wet and nuke warm under his feet. Looking down, he would see that he had stepped into a puddle of blood. Moving further down the corridor, he would see that the marker had been busy reanimating the corpses into more infectors, which began recombinating more bodies into slasher forms. As soon as he is discovered, however, he turns to run when he feels a sharp pain in his chest and something barring his passage. He then feels himself being lifted into the air when he is suddenly thrusted back into the morgue where the infectors begin to recombinate him. Meanwhile, Mercer had found another patient for his cellular regeneration experiments. With the woman pleading for her life, Mercer would indeed ignore her, not thinking of her as a person, but more of an instrument for his research, a means to an end. Surgical log, Dr. Charles Mercer, tissue regeneration experiment five. Please, the children of the marker of kind necromorphs have provided all the material I could ask for. And the infector variant has provided a key insight. Implanting the material directly into the brain renders Doctor, optimal results. Doctor, of course, that requires puncturing the frontal bone please, just above no, the glabella. Please, please, no. Don't worry. It's been sterilized. Dr. Mercer begins to talk to Brant Harris before Nicole can check up on him, with the pair giving exchanges back and forth, with Harris explaining that the codes, or the voices, are hungry to be heard. Mercer would reassure Harris that the other doctors are all fools, telling him that he has divine insight. Harris would reply that God speaks through the markers, which gives Mercer assurance of what he intends to do, is of the right mindset. Mercer would then ask Harris about cellia regeneration. After the interview, Mercer would go back to his office and begins the preparations for one last experiment. However, he was certain that this time he was to be on the right track. He would return to Harris shortly after and tells him that he has a way for him to understand what the marker is trying to tell him, and Harris would agree for the procedure, but Mercer would ask him to join his cause by running a small errand for him. Uh, I was recording. Here, look up for me. Just a sliver of bone between us and Marcus. Relax. It won't be like ages seven and that unpleasantness of the nerves. It wasn't the nurse when I, when I did that. This errand you want me to do in ore storage. Ah. The miners won't like it. They're probably as narrow-minded as the miners in the colony is. Oh, 
God. I can see the mark of skulls. It's, it's been trying to show me. They're hungry. They're coming. They'll make us whole. Don't. I see it now. The marker speaks. We can answer. As Harris and Mercer leave the ER, one travels towards the mining deck and the other to conduct more experiments. Alyssa and her team arrive shortly after this event, following the blood to the morgue, where they find what remains of the bodies. She would contact the bridge when all of a sudden Han's necrotized body rises from the grave and begins to rip and tear Dobbs' flesh right off his wrist, with teeth as sharp as scalpels. Alyssa attempts to pull the slasher off, and the others help to force the creature away from Dobbs before they unload their full magazines onto him, dismembering the necromorph. Unfortunately, the damage had already been done and Dobbs takes his last breath before another slasher form appears from the corridor, attracted by the sounds of battle. After they deal with the dead, Alyssa talks to the captain about the alien life forms that are terrifyingly hostile. At this point, the flight deck has fallen, and the crew deck seems to be next with necromorphs flooding in, killing the crew even while they slept, ate, and even had prepared for their shifts within the showers, leaving a trail of blood and bacterial soup as the infectors get to their own recombination shifts. Soon a cowering Greggs becomes the next target for these strings of assassinations, with the necromorphs breaking down the door to his lab just before another blackout occurs, tearing him to pieces and leaving him behind. Greg's arm had been torn straight off with Jane's fingers resting in his palm. The insides begin reacting to the marker signal that reanimates them into a set of tentacles that begins to morph with Greg's, turning him into another necromorph. Despite the danger and the chaos rippling through the ship, Harris manages to get down to the mining deck, where he encounters a miner who tries to stop him from stealing the osmium that Mercer requires. Security, we got some freak called Harris stealing from ore storage. Dr. Mercer sent me for osmium to complete his work. Yeah, I don't care if God Almighty sent you. You skim from CEC's profit margin, we get screwed. God? So, you can put that osmium down, or I can break your arms first. I worked with people like you on Aegis 7. They'd steal my power nodes. Leave me to dig with no light. Hey, hey! Get off me! But when they abandon you in the dark, it's not empty. The marker whispered its revelations there. Now I understand them. You wanna hear? Warning. Unchanged personnel may not use suit kiosk. No, no, stop, please! I said please when they shut me in. Screamed it too. I promise I won't laugh like they did. Warning. Suit kiosk is obstructed. Serious injury may occur. Oh god! Help me! After this, Harris would successfully return to Mercer, and he would be rewarded with a surgery to better enhance him through the means of stasis. However, Nicole would hear about the recent report about Harris, and goes down to the bridge to file a formal complaint, face to face with the captain, who at this time had been under a tremendous amount of stress, with seeing another group of crew members had been picked off one by one in the mess hall of the crew deck. Matthias would then order Alyssa to pick up her stuff and head down to the crew deck. Shortly, Nicole would find the captain and ask to speak with him about Mercer and Harris. Fine, then we'll waste more time and record this. Satisfied? No, I'm not satisfied. We have a dead miner. We can't sedate Brant Harris. Wasn't Harris originally your patient? You could have warned us that he could observe you. Captain, Harris is suffering from a dementia that we don't fully understand. He was making progress until Dr. Mercer took his case over my objections. I've read them. 
And frankly, this, this vendetta against Dr. Mercer just sounds like more of your bigotry. My what? Do you deny that you've counseled members of our church and turned them against unitology? I'm telling you that Mercer's treatments are immoral and dangerous. And why does he keep taking Harris to hydroponics? Medical is a sanctuary, not Mercer's private lab, so stop covering for him. More accusations and still no proof. You know your way out. He won't stop with Brian Harris, Captain. You know that. While all of this had been going on, Gabe, Lexine, Warren, and McNeil had been getting on board the planet Cracker, traversing the hole through space, and they thought that they would be safe until a rogue necromorph had crashed through the glass and begun to assault them. However, it wasn't much of a fight and they would find a survivor of the infestation. Accompanying the lone survivor, the group would be under constant assault through their journey to the bridge, even failing to save the survivor with him being pulled into the vents. The four would then think to take a trip through the crew deck, where they would eventually meet Alyssa Vincent and her team. She would be surprised to see Gabe, but would have her orders and knocks them out and sends a security team to escort them to medical and contact someone to quarantine them. Alyssa would then proceed to the crew deck to find no survivors present, but upon their travels they would find a large group of slashers that begin to assault them and this time it would be quite the fight, with the team ill prepared to take on such a large necromorph infestation. To the point Pedleton gets ripped apart by the slasher forms, with Chen, Ramirez, Hansen and Alyssa being broken up by the enemy, like it was all part of a divine strategy, with all hope seeming to have faded until Samuel Irons steps in wielding a plasma saw that makes short work of all of the slashers, and he soon joins them on their journey. After being put down and dismissed by the captain, Nicole would attempt to save another one of her patients. After this, Nicole would be at a loss and retreats back to her secret room, which was originally intended to be a room where the unitologists couldn't interfere with her counseling sessions, but now it was the only place she had felt safe. Medical log, Dr. Nicole Brennan. So much for being paranoid. I repurposed this room to run counseling sessions without unitologists interfering. Now it's the only place I feel safe. I recovered a limb after yesterday's attack. Genetically, it's human tissue with bizarre mutations, but it's just a sample. It's not enough to figure out a cure. I need... Wait, where's that report from engineering? engineers pulled something out of machinery. Limbs missing, torso intact. Okay. Time for a real autopsy. Dr. Kine at this time begins to see his dearly beloved wife Amelia and she tells him things to do with the marker, which makes him question the artifact, and after he connects the dots, he rushes to the bridge to inform the captain, of whom had been tracking the infection from his nest. Seeing the infection had wiped out the flight deck and certain areas of the medical deck had been overrun with the recent reports. The captain, however, was under the delusion that they could handle the situation by themselves, and even if he wanted to, they couldn't call for help, as this was to be a restricted sector and they weren't supposed to be in the Aegis Cluster. However, a crew member below in the communications array disagreed and began to send out a wide transmission back to Earth, calling for a mayday. When the captain saw the call for help, he would switch the comms array off, blocking half the message out. However, the first half would be sent through, and the CEC would grow suspicious and an agent of the Earth government would run back to his masters to tell them of the development. Dr. Kime would now arrive at the bridge, telling him that the marker must be a trap before the captain becomes irrational due to the intense pressure and the stress of the situation paired with the insomnia 
and the depression gripping both him and the rest of the crew. Believing that the captain has gone mad, Dr. Kine, regretfully so, declares Benjamin Mathias unfit for duty, to which the captain calls Kine a heretic, before rushing towards him trying to kill Kine while he tries desperately to sedate him. Due to the chaos of the attack, however, Kine ends up stabbing him in his eye which penetrates the frontal lobe and kills the captain. Fearing prosecution, Kine makes a desperate dash to avoid the consequences of this accident and runs back to the medical deck. The others would take the captain to the morgue to be laid to rest and for an autopsy to be carried out. The rest of the crew would be told of the recent events but not the current infection they believe to have been rampaging through the ship, leaving the crew utterly defenseless to future fights. If only they knew, they might have stood a chance. Sometime later, Mercer had put Harris under stasis pending his next surgery while he finalized the new modifications to his stasis module, to which he would use the marker's divine insight to peel back the layers of Harris's mind in surgery to ensure that he will be immune to all toxins and poisons. Kine at this time knew what he needed to do, and that was to make a makeshift quarantine of the ship by launching all of the emergency shuttles so that no one could make it off the ship out of fear of spreading the infection. Meanwhile, Nicole makes it to engineering and finds the corpse of David Swenson and begins her autopsy report. Rig identifies the subject was junior engineer David Swenson. The subject was dismembered after falling into machinery, allowing... God, so sorry. <laughs> some postmortem spasms. chest contains a yellow vial seen in other specimens. I've seen this vial react to dead or bioprosthetic cells. The dead tissue is absorbed, recombined, then reanimated. The vial shares genetic markers with human DNA and a growth on the walls. It's all connected to the marker from each of seven, but how? Dr. Kine studied the marker. Dr. Kine has vanished. Unless he's with the survivors on the mining deck. You'll rest easy now, David. I promise. At this time, the chief engineer had gone down to the bridge to talk to the comms relay team, where Bailey finds her laughing with the crew down there, laughing and joking amongst themselves. Feeling that no one has had the courage to laugh anymore, he decides to leave them be, at least for the time being. Shortly after this, the chief engineer decides to find somewhere warm and quiet to get a good night's sleep. However, she shortly disappears after this event, taking her back to the engineering deck. Engineering log. Chief Engineer Ariel Rousseau reporting. Centrifuge maintenance is... Oh, what was I saying? Uh, I haven't slept right since they brought that marker on board. <sighs> I'm a little, uh, uh, uh... The only thing I remember clearly is that engine inspection. I went into the chamber, and instead of the primary engine, there was... It was a heart. A heart the size of the room, just... Pumping and pumping. Then Henderson said something, and when I looked back, it was a machine again. But I can still hear that pumping in the distance. It's almost peaceful. Could that help me sleep? Oh, if I can get close enough. Yeah. Go right inside, maybe, where it's warm and dark? Ooh, yeah. That makes sense. 
Gabe and the others would soon awaken once again from their slumber, and they managed to escape the medical deck after lifting a quarantine lockdown. However, with the absence of Nicole, they can see that the medical deck has been overrun with the dead crew members. And knowing that it's only a certain amount of time before they turn into more necromorphs, they run back to the security office and they can see the team building a barricade already. And with McNeil's help, they finish building it, trapping the necromorphs inside. Or so they think. At this time, Temple would find Danvers attempting to stop Henderson from pulling his teeth out, who keeps telling them to make it shut up, referring to the voices deriving from the marker calling for the makers to be absorbed. Temple would ask for security to be called down to their location, and the call would go out. The security forces in medical hear the call and ask for Gabe and the others to go down to engineering to back up the security team while they stay behind to better secure the entrance so no one else runs into the slaughterhouse. However, at this time, the tram system had failed and they would have to proceed on foot through the trench access way, but would soon fall into the sewers. Meanwhile, Benson attempts to fix the tram unit, but sees one of the claws has malfunctioned and they require a stasis module to complete the task. So he calls engineering to ask for help. Benson to engineering. You got a stasis module handy? We need one in tram maintenance stat. The autoloader's fried. I got a damaged tram car on the tracks and if the whole system's gridlocked, guess who they're calling? Temple here, sending a stasis module now. What happened to the autoloader? No idea. A lot of shit's been breaking down, and I keep hearing things. Down in the gears where, where no one could be, you know? I know. Underneath the hydroponics deck, Alyssa and what remains of her team would be fleeing the necromorphs with Hansen appearing to be suffering from a case of dementia, only just making it into the elevator, which takes them directly into the deck, where after Hansen loses him to the madness, a group of necromorphs finds and attacks them. In the preceding battle, the team is cut down by two, with Hansen slicing through the back of Chen, cutting her in half vertically, and he then tries to kill Alyssa, before being shot in the back of the head by Ramirez. Overhearing the battle, Hal attempts to find out what is happening, which would lead her into the sewers, where she finds McNeil, Gabe, and Warren, who had been separated from Lexine shortly before this. And after a massive tentacle destroys the platform she had been standing on, she would retreat only to find Lexine after a battle with a brute, and helps her to the central hub of the hydroponics deck. And as luck would have it, they would find her companions. Holy shit! Lexine! Weller! Eckhart! Nate! Lexine! Thank God! I told you they were still alive. We're alive. No thanks to you, Doctor. That's enough, Eckhart. You'd have run too if you had the chance. I'm happy we didn't lose you. Thanks to Dr. Hoyle. She saved my life. A cop, a grunt, and a suit. Quite the team. Don't get me started. What are you doing there? Trying to trap those creatures in the water tunnels. But I can't work out how to shut down the water flow systems. Then allow me. Hydroponics is my domain, remember? Great. Get on it. Is he in charge? He likes to think so. We were headed for the tram station to get to the shuttle bay. Funny. So were we. McNeil with me. We can scout the route while the doc does her thing. I'm coming too. Sure. Eckhart, stay here and keep the doc safe. Of course. You take good care of her, okay? If it weren't for Dr. Hoyle, I wouldn't be here. I'm not a miracle worker, dear. Your injuries still need time to heal. Take care of yourself. Eckhart. Warren Eckhart, isn't it? That's right. Executive Director... Of Colonial Mining Operations. I know. You transferred to the Ishimura just a few weeks ago. <laughs> Worst bloody career move in my life. Nice to know my reputation precedes me. Sure it does. You're the one who switched all the personnel after they found the marker. One day, I had an assistant who'd been with me three years. The next, I found myself working with a grad student who spent her lunch hour praying to the marker. Staff rotation is standard policy, Doctor. 
Resource distribution is my responsibility. And what about seeding unitologists into every corner of the ship? Is that your responsibility too? I fail to see what difference someone's faith makes, Doctor. Look around, you stupid marker head. This awful mess is what difference it makes. If you... <laughs> Very different plans. At this time, Dr. Kine heads down to the back entrance of the medical deck, seeing that the forward entrance had been cornered off, and he sees what Harris has become, sitting in his tank as he recovers from his recent stasis-induced surgery. He then leaves Dr. Mercer a message out of sheer disgust for his actions. Meanwhile, Warren meets the others at the tram station and they decide to look for a way off the ship by going to the maintenance deck and the flight deck. Nicole, however, would find a distraught Dr. Kine and would attempt to leverage some information out of him about stopping the outbreak. Record then. What difference does it make now? Terence, I know the marker is responsible for the outbreak. I need to understand how. It's signal. When it pulses, that signal can trigger alterations in genetic code. Neural structure, even. you felt it, haven't you? But how do I stop it? Mercer must know. He's taken all his marker research up to his room on the crew deck and sealed... No, no. Sealed it? Do you know how? Please, I need Mercer's data. No, he'll kill you. I won't have more deaths on my conscience. Unitology was all I had after I lost Amelia. Look what it's come to. Terence, listen. You loved Amelia. As much as I love Isaac, but if I can't cure this outbreak, I'll never see him again. Please, help me. 39277. He must get into Mercer's room. That coach should still work. Thank you. Here. These are safer with you. Dr. Brennan. Nicole. The only thing Mercer ever feared was death. Now, I doubt he's afraid of anything. Feeling as if Dr. Kine cannot make the marker whole again, he begins thinking to himself that if he cannot take the marker directly back to the planet himself, then he will take the ship back to the planet in order to cease the spread of infection and goes to the computer core to sabotage the stabilizers. Nicole would access Dr. Mercer's quarters and begins rummaging through his notes in order to find out a way to stop the outbreak, but then is caught red-handed by the man in question. But she manages to bluff her way out of this one, however, she in fact does him a favor, which proves to be the final step in creating the Hunter. Uh, Dr. Brennan, let me guess. Terence Kine let you in. Shame he's not here. He didn't understand how this tragedy represents a chance to cure death. Go on. These creatures, reanimated tissue, Cellular immortality. I, I know we've never seen eye to eye, but I understand now. There's so many I should have saved. So you came to me? Because you've learned how to communicate with the marker. I'm so close. I, I thought it must have the secrets that I need. You are a woman of science. Leave the marker to me. These are your autopsy notes. Very thorough. You'll need them peer reviewed, of course. And poor Terence isn't here to help you. Yes. There's only one man I trust now. Very 
useful for Mr. Harris's next surgery. The bridge crew all become nervous as the power goes out once again, and they hear a clanging coming from the elevators. However, it hadn't been the necromorphs, but Alyssa and her security team. But their reunion is short-lived after realizing that Kine is deliberately sabotaging the ship. And so, she takes the remainder of her team down to the computer core, where after rescuing civilians, Samuel falls to the necromorphs, and Ramirez sacrifices himself to save Alyssa, stopping the necromorphs from getting to her. Dr. Mercer at this time would take Harris to the hydroponics deck to finalize his toxin regeneration steps, which makes him believe that he has truly created the hunter the marker desires. You don't mind me recording, do you? You'll lose language soon. It's so green here. There are worse places to work discreetly. They keep poisons here that would never be allowed near medical, and now... You're invulnerable to all of them. Cellular regeneration. Will I kill you? If you try, Mr. Harris, I have options. The containment module, for example. Remember your last brain surgery? Stasis with consciousness? Quite useful. If only I hadn't wasted so much osmium on my last module design. It hurts. <laughs> and how do you feel now? Dead. Awake. Whole. Then perhaps it's time for your first real hunt. After this, Dr. Mercer would take him back to medical to finish his evolution like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly inside of a cocoon. And after a while, he starts to become confused on why the marker continues to remain inert and fails to begin the final stage of convergence. But he then sees the message that Kine had left for him, but completely dismisses it. Surgical log, Dr. Charles Mercer. It's a shame. When I began my research, Terence Kind's insights into the marker were invaluable. Now he's been reduced to sending little missives like this one. You butcher! I saw your hunter! I know who it used to be! That cellular regeneration? Good God, don't you see what you've done? I agree with Amelia. If this is unitology, I want no part of it. My diagnosis? Poor Terence is suffering from the same dementia reported on the Aegis 7 colony. Amelia, for example. The only Amelia is ever mentioned was his wife. And Amelia Kine died seven years ago. An inspector goes down to engineering while all of this had been going on and starts to believe that the rumors of the ship being under attack had truth starting to seep into them with the absence of most of the crew. As Gabe finishes off the task of releasing the hatch so the shuttle can escape the ship when the time comes, he soon finds Warren's true intentions. I believe it is vital Lexine undergoes further examination on Earth. Altman be praised. End of message. What the hell is going on here? Wella, this is confidential CEC business and none of your concern. How dare you? CEC? Sounded more like the church to me, but I guess there isn't much difference anymore, is there? You're in no position to question my authority, Sergeant. Don't talk to me about authority. Now, let's hear that again. This is Overseer Eckhart, code word Oracle, with a message for Enigma Lang. Events on Aegis 7 and the Ishimura are extraordinary. The marker is genuine, though its effects are disturbing, and I am blessed to have survived. I have found the subject you were looking for. Lexine Murdoch, a, a surveyor. She appears immune to the marker's effects, as you predicted. Nobody knows but me. There was a botanist here who suspected my mission, but I've taken care of her. You son of a bitch. I'm afraid so. 
sorry, sir, but I can't let you stop me. I must save Lexi, so that she can save all of us. McNeil was right about you. So were you, actually. But I can't allow your ignorance to jeopardize Unitology's mission. Why Lexine? She fits the profile. I didn't even realize it until we all got on board. But it all adds up. The church sent me to find her. And you just made my job easy. But nobody except the church can know about her. Not even Lexine herself. Not that she would understand. How could she? She's never even experienced this madness that the rest of us succumb to so easily. You must be pretty pleased with yourself. Please, Sergeant. I'm not an arrogant man, merely devout. My reward was... You really were an arsehole. But I guess nobody deserves to die like that. Not even... me. Alyssa soon meets Kine, and after a brief struggle, she defeats him and stays in the computer core room until she gets the stabilizers back online. However, the necromorphs had managed to find the bridge crew and slaughters them. As for White, Chick, and another crew member, they manage to escape through the elevator shaft, taking them up to the ADS cannons. After going through all of Mercer's findings, she would enact on them to find that Mercer had in fact found a way to communicate with the marker, and Nicole would comply with his research until she would be visited by an apparition of the marker who took the form of Octavia Clark. Octavia then tells Nicole of that she knew that they needed to bring the Makers and the Markers will make them whole again. Nicole would tell her that she cannot bring the Markers creators as she believes them to be long since dead and the Marker replies that if the Makers cannot be brought then return what had been taken, put the Nexus to sleep and soon an architect will come. Time is patient. Unsure of what it meant by that, Octavia drifts away with Nicole's hope as she can't think of how she, one person, can return the marker to the planet. Nicole returns to the medical deck, seeing the devastation in the marker's wake after begging and pleading with it to stop it. It wouldn't, and she would begin recording her last message to Isaac. Soon, the delivery of the stasis module had arrived. Unfortunately, one of the doors malfunctions as the man steps through and cuts straight through his arm and he would bleed out rapidly. Upon returning to the maintenance deck, Lexine and McNeil see that Warren had been killed by a leaper and Gabe had been shot by him. Ready to leave the hellscape that is the Ishimura, they decide that there's no time like the present, but Gabe, like always, bursts that little bubble with an issue. The ADS cannons need to be disabled before they leave, otherwise they could be mistaken as another piece of the debris. So McNeil goes into the brainstem of the ship to fix this one last task. Alyssa at this time had managed to restore power to the stabilizers, but is unable to contact the bridge, and she would believe that she had failed to safeguard the crew, and she goes to the flight deck to find the marker, where she finds herself being trapped by the necromorphs who chase her to the base of the monolith. However, to her shock, the slasher forms cannot approach her. She would then think that the marker had been the one keeping the infection trapped on the planet for all those long years. She would then, out of sheer exhaustion, pass out. After waiting for what seems like an eternity, Benson would soon come under attack by some necromorphs, and he would race out of the room and towards the maintenance bay through the elevators, where he would find other survivors. Isaac at this time would see the transmission from Nicole and would fall into denial 
and out of shock and trauma, he would repress the memory of the other half of the video, but would know something was wrong on her end, and would go to the headquarters of the CEC to learn that an emergency response team had been getting prepped and he would volunteer for the mission, and once Hammond had seen his colleagues report on both Isaac and Kendra, they would shortly depart, unknowing that Kendra was secretly an EarthGov agent. The government at this time would hear back from their spies and agents about the Red Marker, and would commission the USM Valor to recover the artifact, and to eliminate any and all threats. As McNeil had been fighting off the necromorphs on the bridge, second officer Chick would attempt to get the first officer to see some sense. Temple at this time would see on the main display that something was wrong with the primary engine. Engineering log, acting chief engineer Jacob Temple reporting. Christ, I still can't believe the chief is gone. It's all fallen apart since the captain died. Everyone down here is on their last nerve. We thought the rioting was the worst of it, until those things came through the vents. Their faces. I mean, fuck, those were my lunch buddies, Liz's friends, old boyfriends. And out of nowhere, the engines are screwed. Primaries laboring, we're hemorrhaging fuel, fuck if I know why. I'm taking Danvers to the fuel depot to fix it. Gotta keep the team focused or we'll crack. Temple out. Suddenly, Alyssa would hear a familiar voice. It had been Ramirez calling out to her. He would tell her to save the ship, which she thought it had meant to send a call for help. However, the marker fully knew the consequences of the ship falling back into the planet and didn't see that to be a desirable outcome. Alyssa would then begin sending her transmission to the CEC shuttle and she would rush straight past the station's necromorphs, patrolling the section of the hangar. The doors to the vacuum would then slide open as part of the venting cycle she had activated and everything not strapped down would be pulled out from the hangar and into the cold, vacant emptiness of space. And as soon as Alyssa had managed to blast the distress beacon out into the void of space, she found her grip to be fleeting as she too was pulled into her own demise. As part of the venting cycle, cargo such as the marker would be sent down to a secure location that needed access codes to be visited by other personnel. Dr. Kine would soon disengage the venting cycle and sees that the marker had been moved. Listening to the voice of Amelia, he would go out to search for the access codes required. Dr. Cross at this point in time would be attempting to find a way to kill the Leviathan growing inside the food storage chamber, but soon sees the infection take a turn for the worst, as Cross's team starts to transform into necromorphs with their lungs bursting from their backs and the corruption growing over them, fusing with them to create more gases. Vowing to end the Leviathan, Dr. Cross would think of a way to create an enzyme to poison the Leviathan. However, for that to work, she would need nitrogen, so she would ask her colleague to go down to the cryogenics lab in medical to go and fetch some. As Temple and Danvers headed down to the fuel lines, they would find that someone had damaged them, so they had taken an hour fixing them, but unfortunately Dr. Kine had locked the circuit breaker room and had taken the key with him, but Temple knew that someone else must have had a spare key, but unfortunately he would never get the chance to find it as the necromorphs had come for him. Meanwhile, McNeil had successfully shut down the ADS cannons, however he soon found himself battling a huge necromorph form known as the Spider, which barred his passage. However, soon after defeating the Abomination, it would then impale the man to the hole, forcing him to use his rock saw to slice his own arm off before he suffocates. Soon, Temple and Danvers had made it to the centrifuge, as someone had been mucking around with it as well, which had been more of Dr. Kine's handiwork, which while they had been doing all of that, Dr. Kine would go back to the fuel lines to sabotage them again. However, all attempts to raise his crew would fail, and Temple would soon find the Kinesis module belonging to Dr. Kine, but no signs of the good doctor anywhere. 
Soon, Temple would come under attack by necromorphs once again, and Danvers would be cut down, forcing Temple to hoof it on his own. Attempting to raise security on the comlink, a crew member would arrive at the bridge. However, the only thing that they would find is what remains of the security force. Security come in! We've been boarded! I repeat, the ship has been boarded! We are under attack! They've killed most of the deck staff! Where the hell is Steve Vincent? We need security back up now! Guns are useless, we... What in God's name is that? Temple would soon arrive at the bridge deck to find no one there, just a vacant working environment with only the blood of the crew members left to tell their stories. Sensing the reality of the situation, he would take off to the mining deck, hoping to find Elizabeth there among the other survivors. Dr. Mercer at this time would be in the crew deck, helping the unitologists under his guidance to gain a chance at their rebirth by flooding the sleep bunks with gas being produced by the Leviathan. Dr. Kine would be at this time making an announcement to all who may be listening, pleading with others to forget the church's teachings and to stand by each other to fight this divine betrayal, and they may just stand a chance. Later down the line, inside of the mining deck, Dr. Kine finds the people he believes who would have the access codes to the storage room. However, he would find nothing here. Dallas here. Security to the mining deck now. Dr. Kine's lost it. Get back! I know how to use this! He, he'll limp for the rest of his life if you don't give me codes to the cargo bay. This is processing. Why the hell would we have codes for cargo? I must get to the marker! We're running out of time! Give me those codes! Christ, is this what you did to the captain? No, no, Ben was an accident! Don't you dare compare me to someone like Mercer! I'm trying to save you! The markers are only hope! No, let him go. He's armed. Where the fuck is security? At this time, the Necromorph's main force had begun rampaging through the maintenance deck to find Lexine and Gabe, where the pair would hold off against the imposing forces, until they hear something that soon alerts Gabe. Nate! He's gone, and if we don't leave right now, so are we. What was that? The contact beam. Shit, if one of those crazies has got their hands on firepower like that. McNeil! Nate! I'll be fine. Just close the goddamn door. Nate! Right now we need to launch. Move over. Hold on to something. Benson at this time had been moving through the maintenance bay with his companions until they would come under attack by more necromorphs and as soon as the fight had been over, Benson would send out an audio message before more would come to cut them down and Benson would become separated from the others. It didn't die. We shot that fucker right between the eyes and it didn't die. Smith had to shoot its fucking arms and legs off. For God's sake, send help. In the outskirts of the planet's reach, a ship shot points into the system, the USG Kellyan, with a crew of five individuals being known as Zach Hammond, Kendra Daniels, Aidan Chen, Hallie Johnston, and Isaac Clark, who had been assigned to the emergency response team for the Aegis mission. There, the team would attempt to contact the crew of the derelict ship they could see before them. However, another had overheard the open transmission and had attempted to warn them, but due to the heavy amount of electromagnetic energy in the area, the voice would appear scrambled and the team would go in 
for a landing. The miners on the mining deck, however, would find that their attempts to survive were to be futile, so they began resorting to locking down certain locations that were known to have been overrun with the dead. With the use of the line gun's secondary ability, deploying lasers, tripwires, among other traps that would cut down anything to cross paths with them, whether it would be human or necromorph. Unfortunately, the miners did not take the ventilation system into consideration as a group of five came out from them, descending down from the shadows. An infector would recombinate one of their fallen associates, Linjin. The infector would then show Dallas what happens to the dead, turning the once deceased individual into a newborn slasher form. With many falling to the infection, Dallas would run out of pure shock, and the others ran in the opposite direction, resulting in a survey charge exploding unexpectedly, killing three of the group, who were known as Shaligal, Fike, and Zittel. The last remaining miner would trap the abominations inside the fourth level of the maintenance shaft, and would take the remains of his colleagues to the smelters to be cremated. The man had been so exhausted from his self-preservation that he wanted to, no, he needed to sleep, but would know if he dozed off for just a moment, it could be one of his last. The man would then find another survivor known as McSweeney, who would yell at him for being selfish, which would begin to give his position away, so the miner would kill his new associate and visit the smelter once again. The miner would then hear his colleagues yelling to him, however these weren't his friends, not anymore. They had been agents of the marker, and listening to these voices meant almost certain death. However, Lin Jin would appear to the survivor of these grisly attacks, and tells him that he needs peace and quiet. He then replied, yeah, and the smelters need fuel, and so, the miner visited the smelters one last time. Dallas, disgusted and deeply disturbed by what he saw in the bowels of the mining deck, would begin to record his last message to anyone who may come this way. Dr. Kine would then shut down all of the tram waiting areas blocking access to the decks via the tram unit. On the hydroponics deck, another survivor would attempt to burn out the gases the Leviathan had been spewing forth by using the purifiers, however this would not seem to have much of an effect, at least not until the marker's architect would arrive to set things right. Inside the flight deck, Isaac and his companions would enter the lounge as they attempt to find those who may be willing to help them proceed with the mission. McNeil at this time had succumbed to his wounds at the spear of the necromorph form, and his transformation would begin as he slept, with the necrotic bacteria coursing through his veins, reconstructing his DNA for a new purpose. Benson at this time had been running away from the necromorphs racing towards him and would eventually be cornered at the bridge under the tram unit and he would be cut down by the approaching necromorphs. Meanwhile, Isaac had successfully repaired the tram unit and had managed to get back to the Kellyan in one piece. However, he would soon find that getting on board the Planet Cracker wasn't to be the issue, but it's getting back that would prove to be the main problem. Go! this incident, Isaac would head to medical to find the captain's rig, however his way would be barred from entry due to McNeil's handiwork, and he would need to find a way of reaching the morgue. On his travels, he would find Nicole's office, in which he would see that she was nowhere in sight. But after he destroys the barricade, 
he would find a hologram of Nicole playing out, which would give Isaac hope that in this ghost ship, there might just be a way to be reunited with his beloved. After facing the horrors of the ER, Isaac would soon find the morgue and the captain's final resting place. After retrieving the captain's rig codes, he would send them directly to Hammond, and he would redirect Isaac to engineering to fix the engines, the centrifuge, and the fuel lines in order to gain some distance from the planet's surface. While Isaac had been fixing the engines and heading to the bridge to fix another sabotage of McNeil, Temple would arrive at the mining deck to find no one home other than the necromorphs who eagerly awaited for someone to trespass into their domain. Seeing no way forwards, he would soon come into contact with someone who was in dire need of help. Arming himself with a new tool, a force gun, he would travel to the crew deck in order to help the individual. However, once he got there, he would find Dr. Mercer, who would stasis him, and with the help of the unitologist survivors, they would place him in a holding cell, and Mercer would find new contacts to torment, and so he would travel back to medical in order to lure the new contact to him. Soon Isaac would be successful in his tasks, and would see a transmission of Nicole calling to all survivors to meet her in medical. With the fires of hope burning in his heart once again, Isaac would rush to medical, while Hammond would head to the crew deck in order to gain a better scope on the infestation of the ship. As soon as Isaac had made it to medical, he would find someone had been doing some spring cleaning, clearing the debris from the hallways and corridors. However, his comms were being blocked off by something in medical. After exploring for a bit, he would come into contact with Mercer, and the two would have an exchange, resulting in Mercer luring Isaac to him, like a spider, welcoming its prey into its humble den, weaving new lines to corner, and finally put an end to their torment, and as soon as Isaac had found the source to the deceit, he would turn the transmission off, but as luck would have it, he would see Nicole again, asking him to make her whole again, when suddenly Isaac would feel as if he was unable to move, as Mercer moved in from the shadows. Isaac Clark. All right. Dr. Brennan's nearest and dearest. We were colleagues, you know. Dr. Chalice Mercer. Are you the reason the marker won't begin? That's it. Convergence is installed. She's meddling. How is the question? But even if I was to ask, I suspect you're not the talkative type. And I haven't fully explored the cause of death as that missing factor. Dismemberment. I think we're on the right track there. <laughs> Try and relax, Mr. Clark. Convergence is so close. Maybe your death will tip the balance.
after Isaac had escaped the hunter Nekromov, he would go straight for Mercer's office to shut him out of the security privileges when he would find someone who came to medical, the professor who had been tasked with getting liquid nitrogen but was unable to due to Mercer's madness. He would ask Isaac to go to hydroponics to help Dr. Cross when Kendra would see the gas levels rising and their next task would be as clear as day. However, Isaac would find that he needed to take care of his pursuer before attempting anything like this. And so, after obtaining the liquid nitrogen, Isaac manages to use the cryogenics lab against the hunter, freezing it entirely. At this time, however, the US and Valor would reach the rendezvous point. With the commander fully informed of the mission and the procedures, they would head deeper into the cluster, finding something floating out in space. An escape pod, which held something very nasty inside. Isaac at this time had managed to find the food storage area. However, Dr. Cross would halt his progress, informing him that the Leviathan would devour him. And the only way to kill it would be the enzyme that she and her colleagues had attempted to create. Isaac would tell her that he has it, and she would instruct him to inject it into all of the Weezer forms who had been spreading the gases around the deck. After exploring the richly dense halls of the hydroponics deck and cutting his way through the corruption, Isaac would find that the Leviathan had only been weakened and had no intention of giving up its new home just yet. So Isaac went into the belly of the beast to fight the abomination, and soon he would be successful, fighting nail and tooth until the monster had been weakened to the point that once the bay doors opened, it could not hold on, and it would be pulled out into the vacuum. Knowing that the USM Valor had been out there searching for them, Kendra would tell Isaac to find an SOS beacon that would give their coordinates to the Valor, so that the retrieval mission can be completed. On board the ship, thinking nothing of it, the commander gives the all clear to the men to open the escape pod, and they find the remains of Chen that would spring back to life and kills the maintenance workers and engineers before escaping into the vents. The Leviathan would use its ability to spew gas to propel itself through space in order to reattach itself to the ship, but this time it would attack the comms array. As Isaac travels to the mining deck and explores the working environments, he would find the mining deck to be on lockdown. With a series of traps lit up, disarming them, he would move deeper into the deck, finding the workplaces of people he had the pleasure of meeting prior to this mission, which had made Isaac feel a massive dose of grief, thinking on how he knew these people, only to see them being torn down or tormented to death, which was very distasteful to him, and would only motivate him more to find the SOS beacon and to get the hell out of there. Isaac would soon find someone, however, who he did not expect to find, Nicole, who would help him to find the SOS beacon, and she would soon tell him to continue with his mission as she will find a way to him. And after braving the rest of the deck, he would soon attach the beacon to the asteroid, waiting to be smelted and sent on its way. Suddenly, as the room went into lockdown, a group of necromorphs would descend upon Isaac, but this time they were accompanied by the hunter who had been thawed out and was ready for round two. Isaac soon escaped the terror posed by the hunter, just barely, as he rose through the levels and back to the tram as he made his way to the bridge to fix the communication array. As Isaac made his way to his objective, the USM Valor had located the SOS beacon and would find the coordinates for the USG Ishimura and would send out a looped message that would continue to play until they gained a response from the derelict mining ship. However, they soon became plagued by the signal of the marker that began to give them the same symptoms of the colony and crew of the Ishimura had been dealing with. And the necrotized Chen would kill the prisoners, which would soon become more necromorphs, such as leapers and infectors, that would begin attacking the soldiers, unaware of such an enemy coming to slaughter them. And after the infectors descend to their corpses, a new form of slasher would be born. 
the Twitchers, and soon the commander would be made fully aware of their plight. As the necromorphs came for the bridge, Cardigan would make a call to arms, telling the soldiers to kill anything that doesn't look remotely human, that the ship has been boarded by an alien, hostile force. However, at this point, it was already too late, as the ship would be completely infested. Isaac at this time would see that their attempts to contact the Valor would be futile, as the Leviathan had survived its last brawl with him, and he would be forced to tear it off the ship once and for all. And by using the ADS cannons stationed there, he would be successful. However, he would soon find that it was all too late for the USM Valor. Making his way into the barely functioning ship, Isaac would be tasked with meeting Hammond inside the engine room to collect the shock point drive in order to fix the shuttle he had found on the crew deck. However, he would soon be contacted by the one who had been branded a murderer. Mr. Clark? Hello? I, I must speak with you. Who is this? Dr. Terrence Kine, the Ishimura's chief science officer. I studied the marker for the church. I'm done talking to unitologists. But, but, but the planet won't rest until the marker is returned. You, you can't leave. Watch me. After braving the perils and dismantling the nuclear warheads, the truth about the Valor's mission would become clear, that they had been on a seek and destroy mission. Soon Isaac and Hammond would be reunited, but they would find that they hadn't been alone. Another malfunction. Half the Ishimura's in the red. Someone get the door open. Huh. Chen? What did that thing do to you? Help me get him to the Kelly. Shoot him. Shoot him. Shoot him. What? Shoot him. Chen? No. You're what killed him. Oh, God. As soon as Isaac had taken the drive, the engines had backfired, causing a chain reaction that caused the ship to go nuclear. Isaac would run for his life, slaying the necromorphs who stood in his way, and eventually would escape the chaos. But Kendra would soon inform him of the necrotized crew that had managed to escape as well, which only made their future tasks even more perilous. At this time, Temple would be visited by Mercer who would ask for his help in making the marker eligible for convergence, and Temple would play Mercer, telling him that he will. However, sensing danger, Mercer would hold on to the modifications made to Temple's force gun, as he told Mercer that he will need it, and soon they made their way to the marker, which is where Isaac meets the pair, and Temple would make his intentions clear to the good doctor, blasting him with a kinetic wave from his force gun. Unfortunately, this wasn't enough to put Dr. Mercer out of commission, and he retaliated with his modified stasis module, giving him complete advantage over him. Mercer! Still alive, Mr. Clark. I'm still denied convergence thanks to this ingrate. Mercer, wait. Tell me. I want to understand. What is convergence? But you already know. Dead or living, we all feel the marker's to purpose. Don't you want to be reunited with the people you lost? Aye. Yes. Then why not it me? Mr. Temple has refused, but we are so Everything that has happened on the Shamora is just the beginning. When you put it that way, you and your marker can go to hell. Your death will come 
As Isaac cleared the path to the marker, he could hear the voices of Nicole and Chen whispering to him, with a familiar tune being played to him of Nicole's message that had been sent to him, as if his subconscious had been warning him of an imminent plight. Shaking this off, Isaac would be soon reminded of a call the pair had prior to these events. Isaac would be even more determined to save Nicole now, setting things right. Isaac would soon find Dr. Kine, who would explain to him that his findings on the necromorphs seemed to be behind the outbreak, and that the marker had been suppressing the massive behemoth in the core of the planet, that it must be returned in order to cease the infection. Kine soon made Isaac see reason to help him, and he would take the marker to the shuttle, but an old enemy would return for the final battle, where the hunter would be accompanied by an assortment of necromorphs. The odds were certainly against Isaac, but he soon got an idea that would prove to be instrumental in putting Harris out of his misery once and for all. After being dragged back to medical, Isaac would head to the flight deck. However, the state of the ship would force him to move faster and fight harder than ever before, as the entire ship had been dying to this cancer flowing through the internal workings of the ship, with doors and primary systems seeming to malfunction, not working, or to have a mind of their own. However, Isaac soon completed his mission with the marker, but soon he would find that the closest of allies may not be who they say they are. Aegis 7 was off limits. The planet was one big government experiment. The marker, this divine artifact, it was built by human hands. That's impossible. It's an alien world. The miners dug up the fucking thing. After it was planted here a few hundred years ago. Even kind didn't pick up on that. They found the first marker in some crater on Earth. That one. That was real. Alien. Enough to inspire you mythology. Our people studied it and reverse engineered this red marker. But they needed somewhere to test it. Aegis 7. You've seen the result. The stuff of nightmares. I thought the old reports were just hysteria. Until I saw what I saw. They sealed off the whole system, buried the records nice and clean. Until CEC got greedy. Those idiots tore each of seven apart and woke up with the old research team left behind. So Earth Gulf sent you to sweep it all under the rug. Damn it, we have to return the marker. 
If anyone else stumbles across Aegis 7... It was disappeared once. We can do it again. I've seen how the marker fucks with your head. It must be contained. For what it's worth, we made a great team. You'll find another way off the Ishimura. I mean, you're one hell of an engineer. Your experiment's gonna kill us all! Daniels! You made it. I tried to find you. Half the Ishimura's coming apart, and the other half swarming with those things. How'd you get here? You cleared the way. I can always count on you. Not this time. Daniel screwed me over. You couldn't have known she would take the marker. She left us to die. There's still hope. You can recall the shuttle and remote pilot from here. Bring back the marker and we can return it to AG7. You can make us whole. I just don't know what to believe anymore. It's okay, Isaac. You'll know what to do. Recalling shuttle USG-09. Prepping remote docking procedures. Damn it, Isaac! You don't know what you're doing! I know! Someone's gonna answer for this. You're fucking kidding me! Shit! Warning. Escape pod launch detected from shuttle USG-09. Escape pod. Damn! We lost her. It doesn't matter. She can't escape her fate. But who can? I'll reprogram the shuttle with our flight path to Aegis 7 and join you on board. I never doubted you, Isaac. I knew you'd come back for me. Are you ready? Yes. We're together again. Nothing can stop us now. This isn't how I imagined saying goodbye to the Ishimura. Isaac would then pilot the shuttle down to the planet, and against all odds, he would be successful in placing the marker back on the pedestal, forcing the dead to sleep, and in doing so, giving Isaac the mental blueprint that cannot be forgotten. However, at this time, Kendra had located Isaac who had ran to the terminal to restart the gravity tethers that was shut down by the marker's EMP blast, where she would hold a gun to Nicole's head, forcing Isaac to watch the video once again and to finally see reason. Wriggling override. This time, watch to the end. <laughs> Isaac, it's me. Oh, I wish I could talk to you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about everything. I just wish I could talk to someone. It's all falling apart here. I can't believe what's happening. It's strange. Such a little thing. Just had to talk. That's all this research was in the end. Not much, is it? Just trying to make it listen when he begged for convergence. But I had a different prayer. It spoke. And then it listened. Make this stop, I said. Maybe 
it understood, but... Isaac would then rush to the landing pad, hoping to beat Kendra back to the shuttle. However, against all of the odds, she managed to beat him there, as he soon saw when he frantically ran towards her, looking for salvation to find only the end of her pistol. Oh, my God. 
After escaping the horrors of Aegis Seven, Isaac would witness the destruction of the colony. However, for the Ishimura, it would be flung out into deep space with the tectonic load, exploding, acting as a slingshot. Here it would continue to make shock points all over the system until the foreseeable future. For Isaac, however, he would soon find that his torment had only just begun. After a week of the incident, and with no word from the Valor or the Ishimura, the government would be at a loss, and the CEC would soon announce the disappearance of their flagship, which would drive the fall for deep space mining, and with the decline of the CEC on one hand, and the failed attempts to retrieve the marker on the other, the government would send the USM Victory to the Aegis Cluster, in order to begin the cover-up operation, where their objectives were clear, to assess the marker's whereabouts and the location of the USG Ishimura. However, they wouldn't be the only ones in the Aegis Cluster, and soon a ship that had been an Observer-class ship would find Alyssa's Distress Beacon floating nearby, and after confirming the Ishimura had been in the Aegis system, Gavin would contact Secretary Chang of the Earth Defense Force, who would tell him to dispose of the others and to await further orders. After killing his colleagues, the USM Victory would arrive, and Gavin, feeling the guilt of his colleagues' deaths coming over him, would decompress the airlock with him still inside, sending him hurtling through space without a suit on. The Victory would then collect the data recorded by the crew, and they would destroy the ship, leaving no traces behind as they moved towards their rendezvous point to set up a blockade. Soon, however, they would send a series of prospectors to investigate Aegis 7 to find a molten surface with lava spewing out from the core of the planet and the gravity appearing compromised with boulders and rocks floating in the air itself, as if something had been holding the planet together, waiting to be rediscovered. Soon the Victory would get news of a distress call being issued out from an executive class shuttle, and the Victory would send a team to investigate, and they would find a rattled and crazed Isaac. After sedating him, they would return to the Victory, and upon interrogating him, they would discover the truth behind the incident, and what really happened to the colony, the USG Ishimura, and the USM Valor. The Victory would soon relay the news to the Overseer, who would commission the USG O'Bannon to return to the planet in order to find these shards of the marker, bleeding into the events of both Dead Space Aftermath and Dead Space Salvage. 
As the O'Bannon had been docked at the sprawl, a meeting with the key personnel would be held, with the captain who would tell them of their mission that was to stabilize Aegis 7. However, as the non-essential personnel, that being the engineers, had left the briefing room, Captain Campbell would address the rumors surrounding the events of Dead Space, and he would confirm the discovery. After the briefing had come to a close, the O'Bannon had begun their travels to the planet, and after reaching Aegis 7, they would soon send the gravity stabilizers and teams to the planet, as Stross, Cho, Kutner, and Serjanko and Rin went off to search for the missing artifact. However, Kutner would find the marker, or what was left of it. He would soon pick up the shard, holding it up above him to get a better look at it, and the marker shard would respond with a pulse that gave him the mental blueprint, with him being able to see the full marker that it once had been. However, he would exclaim that he cannot understand the vision he had received until he heard a familiar voice, one from his past, which had been his daughter, who would begin to torment Kutner with him revisiting the accident he had tried so hard to forget. Soon Cho found a deeply terrified Kutner, who looked at her as if she had been a monster, come to attack him, and this would be the same for the others until he saw Vivian once again, but this time on the gravity stabilizer who appeared to have been captured by the monsters, which would force him into a frenzy. After the attack and Noah had been killed, Kutner would be restrained inside of the shuttle and the shard would be contained as well. The stabilizer, however, much like the planet, would begin to go nuclear, forcing the teams to retreat to their shuttles in order to escape the planet. However, Rin would fall into a ravine of lava, cooking her alive, and Omar would be crushed by a boulder falling from the sky, and Sajanko would be too cooked in his suit due to his escape route being elevated, trapping him with the lava fast approaching him. The others would soon escape the planet and would avoid planetary debris floating in space with other shuttles not being so lucky until finally they had reached the hangar bay of the O'Bannon with them crash landing. Borges would take the shard to the bridge where he goes to reclaim some answers from the captain but he would soon be dismissed as he had been trying to organize the crew to flee the blast radius, and it seemed that they were going to be successful, until the last second when the planet exploded, and chunks of the planet impacted the ship, causing damage to the engines, decks becoming decompressed, and terminals exploding, causing a significant loss of life, as the ship floated inside the debris field that continued to hail them. The captain would then take Borges, Cho, and Stross to his office to provide some clarity and to assess what they had found. Meanwhile, on the other side of the system, a group of pirates and scavengers known as the Magpies would be using a shock ring to bring clusters of ores and other materials to their storage ship, known as the Nest when all of a sudden the USG Ishimura would shock through the ring, destroying the nest and damaging other ships as well, as it gracefully drifted past them. Using their gravity tethers, they would slow the rate of the ship long enough to allow them entry to the flight deck's hangar. However, as they traveled deeper into the deck, they would find the corruption filling the halls, but it had been more of a soup now, 
Once they had begun testing the soup with their equipment, they would find that it consisted of human DNA, which would deeply disturb them. On their travels, they would go to the bridge to find out what actually happened on the planet's cracker, where the leader of the magpies nearly gets crushed by a malfunctioning door. Back on board the USM Victory, the commander would be met by the Earth Defense's secretary, David Chang, who would arrive with the aid of two specialists known as the Oracles, who were interested in recovering the marker. However, they would still have no word on the planet's cracker, but would have updates from the O'Bannon, but they haven't been able to contact them again. On the whole of the Ishimura, Maoyag begins to investigate what he believed to have been crystals that could be worth a lot of money, but to his surprise, they had been pieces of the Marker 3A, which would make Maoyag fall into a deep sleep. When he awoke, he found himself to be inside the mining deck, but he wasn't alone. He would find the Hunter Necromorph reborn which began to march towards him. Terrified of the monstrosity, he would flee outside of the hole, and the fully formed marker would be waiting for him, with the shards presenting a mental blueprint to him. But as he touched the marker, he would burst into flames before waking up outside the hole. Grasping the shard in his hand, Maoyak would then take the pieces inside of the hole, and the team would meet him on the mining deck, where the leader, Jessica, would claim that Unitology would pay a lot of money for their holy artifact, but Maoyak would soon assault her, calling it heresy. She would then order that he be placed in the brig until he has calmed down. However, another member of their team, Copland, would take a piece of the marker back to the ship with dissent in her mind as she begins to flee towards the blockade. Back on board the O'Bannon, Stross goes to visit the captain where he can see that the shard had an effect on him, with Captain Campbell telling him that the shard had been talking to him. Stross takes the shard to his laboratory but under strict orders to keep the experiments and research inside the lab as they can't afford any more mishaps. Through his research, Stross would begin to have visions deriving from the marker shard, which would present him with symbols that when studied, turn into a code for DNA. After a visit from Cho, however, he would exclaim his fascination with the shard, and after becoming curious, he would take a body from the morgue, placing it into a containment unit with the shard to see the effects it would have on it. Seeing the transformation happening right in front of his eyes, he calls it beautiful before the lights go out, which frustrates him even more so. But then, as soon as the lights come back on, the corpse had disappeared, and after he runs into the containment unit, he finds that life had sprung back into the deceased individual, who then grabs Stross by the throat, telling him that it's all his fault, that they will all suffer because of his actions. Snapping out of his hallucination, he then sees his mistake, which frees the slasher form from the containment unit, and after witnessing his assistant Sandra's death, he would flee from the terror, allowing the marker to spread its signal to the corpses in the morgue, which begin to transform. On board the Ishimura, a similar issue had been brewing, with Maoyek waking from a deep slumber only to see that the brig had been transformed into a bright plain rather than the darkened halls. A voice that sounded like Belovin would soon beckon him, telling him that he needs to wake up. Confused, Maoyek asks that he isn't already awake. Completely unaware that the marker signal had reanimated the corruption behind him as it began to sliver towards him, Belovin then tells him not truly awake when Maoyek would find that he had become one with the corruption as it slowly begins to kill and recombinate him turning him into a necromorph. On the O'Bannon, things had only been getting worse with Stross hiding from the slasher form. He would have no choice but to witness more deaths at his hands. With the necromorph slaying the maintenance workers, it would be so horrific that this would force him from his hiding place as he fled into the shadows. All over the ship, 
necromorphs would begin descending from these shadows, with them slaying the crew, which only adds to their ranks. Soon Cho and some of her colleagues would go to the morgue to find the bodies had disappeared and a necromorph would charge towards them until one of them seals the room. With alarms blaring, Cho would rush to Kutna to shield her concerns until she hears the necromorph pounding on the door. Doc, what's going on? Oh my god, this can't be happening. Doc! It, it can't be! Am I going crazy? What the fuck is that? Get me out of here. Get me off this table now. It's the monsters, isn't it? I knew they'd be back. Come on! Come on, you bastard! Here I am! Right here! What the hell is it? In the brig of the Ishimura, Jessica would go to see Malyek, seeing if he had reformed yet, but she would only find death in her wake. As the newly formed slasher dissected her, and like the O'Bannon, necromorphs would begin coming out of the ventilation systems, with two outbreaks occurring at the same time. Copland at this time would be inside of an interrogation room with the two oracles, and after she spills the tea, they would give her an internal reward. The oracles then proceed to the coordinates gleamed from her testimony inside their stealth ship, and the commander would take a team of soldiers with him to the derelict mining ship. Stross would then arrive inside of his quarters to find that a necromorph had managed to get inside. Horrified that this lurker form could present a danger to his family, he would begin to kill it by hitting it over the head with his cutter. He then sees another rushing towards him out of the darkness only for him to slice the necromorph apart. However, unlike the others, this one came with a muffled, distorted voice, asking in a saddened and deeply horrified tone, why? This would make him pause for a moment, only for him to complete the act, when the doors would slide open once again, revealing Cho, who would see the terrible truth to this act with Stross's wife and child motionless in a pool of their combined blood. Cho would run out of the room screaming, you monster, over and over again. This would confuse Stross deeply, asking what was the matter when they would see the captain and the security detail protecting him, fighting off the necromorph horde, fighting against impossible odds, Kutner then sees Vivian again, who leads him into a nearby access way, which had been too small for the necromorphs to follow them into due to their enlarged size. The rest of the group would soon follow him into the vent, but the security officer would be grabbed and soon her efforts would go silent, as the captain relaxed reluctantly moved on into the ventilation system as they were headed to Stross's lab. At this time, the CEC were frantically asking too many questions that the government could not answer right at that precise moment. They would then contact the USM Victory to find these answers who would continue attempting to gain contact with the O'Bannon. But after several attempts, they would find that there was no reply. They would then send the USM Abraxas to find the ship and to recover the survivors of the event. On the USG Ishimura, the magpies would be under assault from the nightmare of the necromorph infestation and they would all fall to the terror, except for Stefan, who managed to stay alive. But he would soon see on the security cameras that a new shuttle had appeared and two new signatures too had appeared from the vessel, along with a transmission coming from a military shuttle fast approaching the planet's cracker. In an attempt to buy him some more time, he would lie to the commander that he had been in one part of the ship when he wasn't, which would actually work like a charm as he allowed them entry out of what they thought was good faith, and as soon as they had landed in the bay, the soldiers flooded out, scouring their surroundings with their flashlights, hoping to apprehend the culprits. However, they would too find only death in the dark. The oracles would leave the soldiers to their fate, 
seeing that a signature had been on the bridge deck, so they knew that this was to be a lie. The commander would be so stunned by the situation that had turned against him so quickly that he orders the pilots to get them the hell out of there, but he would soon see that he was on his own as they too had been slaughtered and the Necromorphs would find only an easy target inside of the shuttle waiting for them. Inside of the O'Bannon, Laboratories Borgers would find Kuttner with the others and begins to choke him with his prosthetic metal arm for what he had done to his cousin, Noah. Soon though, the captain was able to regain control with the pair of them, and they soon, with Stross's help, come up with a plan of action in ending the outbreak, where they would begin to head towards the engine room to destroy the shard. The Oracles, on the other hand, would locate the shard of the marker in the security room of the bridge, but would see that they weren't in the condition that they had hoped, which they had hoped that they could find the main article of their design. But they would soon locate Stefan, who had been on a spacewalk, and they soon suited up to traverse the exterior hull of the bridge, where they would corner Stefan, only for a hive mind form to come out from behind him, where he would soon flee, and the two oracles would dispatch the behemoth with moderate ease with their strange laser weapon, slicing it up into pieces. Using their knowledge of the ship's interior, they would soon corner Stefan once again, next to the airlock of the USM Valor. Stefan would convince the pair that he had rigged the plating to the device in his hand, which would crush them if he activated it. There, they would provide clarity about the markers and the necromorphs, who were unfortunate side effects to the markers' capabilities. However, at the end of these questions, the device would go off, triggered by the radiation lingering in the air, which signaled to the oracles that Stefan had lied to them and was merely stalling them, and one of them would rush to him, attempting to grab him as he enters the airlock, when the door would slam shut, crushing his arm and slicing it off completely, and the necromorphs had managed to find them, who would begin to slaughter the two, adding to their convergence. Stefan would then look down to the arm to see that the laser weapon had been in the palm of the oracle's hand when it had become severed. There he exits the airlock and begins his journey towards the flight deck in order to reach his ship. On the O'Bannon, the team came across some twists and turns with an acid-spewing necromorph that melted the flesh off of a unitologist crew member's face, which slowly kills her due to the shock and a rogue asteroid causes a decompression, killing another member of the team. However, once the remaining members make it to the door, they soon find it to have been damaged from the other side, meaning that one of them will have to seal it from the decompressed side, which would trap them with the necromorphs. But Campbell would volunteer for this task and he complies with it, but not before embracing the necromorphs with a grenade in hand, blasting them all into pieces, and giving the four a chance, which would be short-lived when they saw the entirety of the necromorph force had been conjugating inside of there, and the team would have to fight their way to the core of the engines. Coming out of shock space, the USM Abraxas would find the derelict first responder class ship, Floating amongst the planetary debris in a cloud of corpses, the frigate ship would then board the O'Bannon, and they would cut their way through the hole to enter the halls of the CEC ship. However, once they applied night vision to the pitch black halls, they soon regretted that decision as they saw the remains of the crew with one of them claiming that it looked as if a wild animal had torn straight through them. In the fight for control inside the engine room, Stross would pick up the marker shard as the others fought for their lives, just staring at it, with the voices flooding through his mind. Isabel Cho would have enough of this insanity and would pry the shard from him as she throws it into the core, setting off a chain reaction that destroys the shard and the necromorphs would return to a sludge of human tissue. 
The soldiers would then track the survivors' whereabouts, and as soon as they had made contact with them, they would rejoice, but would find Kuttner to be less than helpful when he attacks one of them. The soldiers then retrace their steps, taking the survivor aboard the USM Abraxas, and they soon destroy the O'Bannon, before shocking out to the sprawl to meet the overseer, who informs the interrogators that they must contain the truth of the matter, and to find those who had direct contact with the marker. Inside the halls of the Ishimura, however, Stefan would find the flight deck overrun with necromorphs and his ship completely infested with new types of the necromorph horde. But then, as he turns his head, he would see the stealth shuttle, and so he takes off inside the Oracle's ship and flees to an unknown destination, but he would give the Ishimura's coordinates to David Chang, who attempts to get him to arrive at the USM Victory, but Stefan insults him and continues to flee from the system. On board the USM Abraxas inside shock space, after Kuttner gives his account of the events, he would find that the interrogators wanted him alive, but when he kills the guards and uses their weapons against them, Kuttner flees in the pursuit of Vivian, who leads him straight to an airlock. The soldiers would rush towards Kuttner, attempting to stop him, but they soon are all sucked into deep space and are helpless as the ship soars away from them. Borges would be next to enter the interrogation room and after giving his account, they would give him a false sense of security, telling him that he will be given a free pass, but they soon shot him in the back of the head, eliminating another loose end. Stross would be next and giving his account, they would find that a complete mental block had been built around the fate of his family. The exposure of the marker would intrigue them so much so that they would hold him in a stasis unit for the rest of their journey towards the sprawl. And finally, Isabella Cho would be next, and after giving her account to the events, she would be met by the Overseer, who would order for the interrogators to receive their eternal reward. The Overseer would attempt to get Cho to see things his way, but when she continued to refuse him at every single turn, she would be restrained against her will and then lobotomized to fit the role of the terrorist who destroyed the colony, killed the crew of both the Ishimura and the O'Bannon, completely covering up the events. Back inside of the Aegis system, however, the soldiers would destroy the marker shards, rendering the necromorphs back to their soupy state, and they would soon pilot the derelict mining ship back to the sprawl to be cleaned out and returned to service. And that is it for the complete history of the Aegis system, and this video by far was the hardest timeline to construct for this channel so far. As with how much information I had to compile and sort through, it was quite the journey to behold. Along with some events being rewritten due to certain characters not being able to be there to attend said event. And this video had certainly given me a simulation of what it would be like to have my mind warped by a marker. But regardless, I hope you found the video to be insightful about the in-depth story and had enjoyed your time with me. As truth be told, I wanted to use all of the logs in the remake to do the timeline justice, rather than just focusing on the key elements of the story this time, which is why this had taken so long to make. But maybe Motive will give us a remake of Extraction to fill in the gaps to the Extraction crew's story, or maybe a bit of DLC. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed, then hit the like button. Comment what you thought about this video down below and I look forward to hearing from you. Sign up to join the British Alliance today by hitting the subscribe button and ringing in the notification bell to receive all updates from the channel. A special thank you to all of my channel members for your extra mile support. It certainly does help in content creation and I appreciate all of you. And if you would like to become a member today and share in the exclusive benefits, then hit the join button and see which of the tiers sounds right for you. And I will see all of you among the cosmos and be sure to leave this video having a good one.